Good evening. I am Cecilia Taylor and welcome to the City Council's May 14th Special City Council Meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in City Council Chambers. Please note public comment speaker time may be limited. First, I'd like to introduce City Council members and staff present. Vice Mayor Drew Combs may be joining us later. City Council members Maria Dorr, Betsy Nash, and Jen Woolison. Staff present are City Manager Justin Murphy, Assistant City Manager Stephen Stolte, and our Assistant City, City Attorney Denise Bazano, and our City Clerk Judy Heron. Ms. Heron, would you please provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. And again, echoing a welcome to our special May 14th City Council meeting. For members of the public who wish to provide comment on an item on tonight's agenda, after the mayor calls for comment on that item, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine at that time. If you are participating in person, feel free to complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. That concludes my instructions. Mayor Taylor, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron. The next item is item C, agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order and any requests from city council members. Does, does the city council desire to modify the order of our agenda? Item D, study sessions. Study sessions are an opportunity for city staff to introduce an item that will require policy direction from the city council in the near future. City staff will provide a presentation. I will then call for public comment. After public comment, the city council will discuss the matter interactively with staff. The city council will not take an action on items addressed in study sessions. The City Council may provide direction to City staff for preparation of additional analysis or information necessary when the item returns to the City Council for action. The study, item, the study session item before us tonight is item D1, provide direction on the five-year capital improvement plan. Here to introduce this item is our Public Works Director, Azalea Mitch. Good evening, Council Members. Azalea Mitch, Public Works Director, here to speak to you um, about the Capital Improvement Plan for the next five years. So on the agenda, I'll provide an overview of the projects that we are proposing to be part of the plan, the funding sources, how we've prioritized these projects, the uh, new funding requests with a specific focus on the general fund, our five-year outlook, and we'll solicit your feedback and answer any questions. As you are rather familiar with, the CIP consists of seven overall project categories, and these these pro these uh, categories primarily consist of programs that are focused on maintaining and improving our existing infrastructure. The sources of funding for these projects are um, we have quite a a number of funding buckets. Uh, the general fund provides a baseline of $3 million a year. That's an annual transfer to the general capital fund. However, over the last five years, we've seen that average be $4.7 million. Uh, the enterprise fund on water provides, uh, sustains all of the improvements needed on the water infrastructure. And then we have quite a few special revenue funds as well as grants. How we prioritize the projects in the plan really depends on your priorities, which you set every year. The planning documents, such as our condition assessments and master plans, uh, the availability, availability of funding, and then the staffing. So we do rep report out to you the, the uh, status of our projects. Um, we share with you whether a project is in the planning, design, or construction phase. The planning phase consists of really the project initiation. So we identify the needs, 
uh, the objectives goals. We uh, assess whether additional studies are needed, such as feasibility assessments or condition assessments. We identify staff as well as our stakeholders, and then we develop the scope of work, the budget, and the schedule. Once that planning is completed, we move on to the design phase, and that involves taking um, a project from through concept, from concept through final design, as well as the environmental clearances needed. Once the, the designs are completed, we uh, develop a bid packet. So we issue the project, we um, go out to bid. And then once those bids are uh, received and reviewed, we come back to you to award those projects. And throughout that construction process, we uh, were inspecting the work. Now, there are quite a few programs that we, uh, that the status to report it to you is ongoing, and that's because these programs consist of projects that are in various phases, whether in the planning, design, or construction phase. So uh, nothing can be delivered without our staff, and up on the screen is an overview of our current uh, organizational structure as well as the, the number of vacancies that we do currently have. Our utilities group focuses on the delivery of water, stormwater, and landfill projects as well as what it takes to operate those utilities. Uh, they, the CIP group is the core group that solely focuses on the delivery of capital projects, and these focus on our streets, our facilities, um, and any other categories where engineering is needed. Now, it's important to note that on the water side, uh, some of the positions are solely funded by the, the water enterprise, and that makes the... Uh, sort of moving of staff uh, rather challenging because those positions are, uh, are funded solely by that, um, by the enterprise. On the transportation side, we, uh, our group focuses also on capital delivery, but also on our programming. So they manage our infrastructure, our traffic signals, our shuttles and safe routes to school program and also work very closely with our planning group on uh, development reviews. We do have a few vacancies here as well on, on uh, both, uh, both divisions. The, we, the assistant public director positions are vacant and we have a number of um, other positions that we're waiting to, to fill. So a lot goes into uh, sharing with you this proposal on the CIP. This year, we have, this coming fiscal year, we have 64 projects, an estimated 54 million in carryover, and we are requesting 43 million in additional requests. Uh, it's important to note that around a quarter of the, the new requests that we have really go toward maintaining the existing infrastructure to, to those programs, uh, focus on streets, on facilities, uh, aquatics, uh, traffic, and water. And as you can see from this pie chart, the, the new funding request for this year, uh, the tra traffic and transportation category is rather large, and that's because we have some significant projects such as the Middle Avenue undercrossing. If we look at our total budget, so that means the carryover in addition to what we are requesting for this fiscal year and new funding, 50% um, of that, uh, fund, those projects will be funded through our special revenues. Uh, let's see, 34 um, from water, and then, sorry, 30, 34 from the general fund, and then 15 from the water fund. Those are the major sources of funding. Not included here are our grants, because those vary year to year, and a lot of them are based on reimbursements. So we have to pay and then request for that, that reimbursement after. We look at our total, um, how are we spending that money? So our big categories for this year, as we look at the total budget, the 97 million, traffic and transportation, as well as our streets and sidewalks. So of the new money that we need for our projects this fiscal year, 12 million um, is, it will, the request is for it to come from the general fund because we do not have other sources of revenue to tap. 
This year, we are requesting $12 million to be transferred into the general capital fund. Now we are estimating an offset of 7 million because of the grants that we have acquired and uh, upcoming ta tra tax credits related to the, uh, the renewable infrastructure that we're about to complete. So overall, the net request is for a $5 million transfer. The next slides, few slides, are to really walk you through uh, the general fund request as it relates to the different uh, categories in the CIP. So for city buildings and systems, all of the new funding requests um, are come, will, would tap the general fund. We're looking at adding funding to our city buildings minor. Our fire plan and equipment replacement project for the buildings here at Burgess, uh, we do not have the uh, sufficient funds to actually execute that project. We have renovations at the Burgess pool, our continued implementation of the IT master plan, and as well as improvements to the exterior of our buildings, such as our roofs um, that we have ongoing uh, repair needs for. Parks and Recreation, uh, $1.8 million request from the general fund, and this is really to sustain our ongoing parks and rec uh, facilities. So we have, we're assessing the condition of the pool, the CO2 room. We have paths at our parks that need to be re replaced, uh, also playground replacements, and then the uh, improvements on our sports fields and sport courts. Streets and sidewalks, we have an ongoing sidewalk repair program uh, that we, uh, we ask for annual funding for. And this year we're coming to you requesting additional money for the high voltage street light conversion. Now there were, um, uh, this effort, we completed the conversion in Suburban Park and Flat Triangle last year. The next phase for this fiscal year is for West Benlo and the future phase will be Linfield Oaks. On the stormwater front, we have two projects that we actually uh, brought to you earlier uh, this fiscal year. This is additional money that's needed to complete the Chrysler pump station and also the repairs needed um, along San Francisco Creek by the Alma Street pedestrian bridge and Caltrain crossing. On the traffic and transportation front, we were just here uh, getting direction on the Middle Avenue complete streets. So the request for this fiscal year is for money to um, do the resurfacing from San Mateo Drive to El Camino. On the environment front, we have two projects that need additional funding. That is the, uh, the electric vehicle chargers at the city facilities were currently in design. And we've been working with PG&E on the uh, the, um, uh, the electrical needs on the meter front so that we can actually build the EV charging facilities here and at the courtyard. And then we also have a very outdated irrigation system for our parks that really, that relies on a computer that is not an Apple IIe, but, but like it. And uh, we are looking at opportunities there to, to obtain some grant funding, but this is pretty outdated infrastructure that we need, uh, we need it to be replaced. Now in the coming, um, coming year, we are working very closely with our sustainability group to fully, more fully define our needs for electrifying this campus and other facilities. So once that those scopes are more developed and we have a better sense of the funding needs, we will be bringing that back at a future point. So other non-general fund related projects that we, uh, we, well, some of them are general fund, some of them are not, but to highlight the larger efforts, we, uh, we are working on Safer Bay, um, San Francisco Creek, we have the upstream of 101 improvements, uh, plaza parking uh, renovations that we, we need to embark on the ongoing street resurfacing needs, as well as our plans to continue to implement the Vision Zero Action Plan and focus on, on safety and safe routes. So as you can see, I like pie charts and graphs. I hope that you can, that this gives you a 
good visual. Um, we have by category quite a few projects ahead of us, uh, ahead of us in, in terms of the five year outlook. We have Safer Bay, that is a $67 million project effort that we, uh, we fortunately have grant funding for and, uh, and matching from PG&E and Meta. We have quite a few large transportation projects, the Middle Avenue Undercrossing, Quiet Zone, and also Great Separation. And, uh, and then on the waterfront, we have large infrastructure needs as it relates to storage. And some of these needs are unfunded. So on the, uh, on the water side, this is an enterprise. So we will be looking at a funding study. We'll take a look at opportunities on uh, loans from the state revolving fund through the water board. We'll also be assessing bonds. So the intent here is to get a, a, a to work closely with a consultant and assess what options we have to finance the future needs. We did just complete a stormwater uh, master plan and this identified $39 million in needs. And this just focuses on the condition of our, of our storm drain system, not our flood protection needs. Uh, that is significant, $39 million in, in need. So we, uh, we need to work with a consultant as well to assess what, what, how to finance these uh, improvements. And of course, there's great separation, which will be uh, a significant undertaking. So the next steps are, um, we are here tonight to seek your direction, uh, receive your input. Uh, on May 23rd, there will be a public budget workshop, the hearing, public hearing on June 11th, and final adoption on the 25th. So in terms of direction, um, it's uh, we need your feedback on the new request for fiscal year 24-25, as well as the five-year outlook. Your insight as it relates to strategies on how to best manage the minor capital needs. Um, a lot of our five-year plan consists of programs that really focus on the existing infrastructure, but it can be hard to then evaluate and prioritize additional needs. Um, are there any projects that we should delay or any other projects that we should replace with, with new projects? And with that, we very happy to seek your direction. Thank you for the presentation and bringing it back to the council. Are there any clarifying questions before we take public comment? Ms. Heron, can you take public comment at this time? Yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our study session item D1, provide direction on the five-year capital improvement plan. If you are participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. Thank you for those who have their hands raised gauge the number of speakers. This will be the final call for public comment on study session item D1. Please engage that hand feature, press star nine, or complete a speaker card. Okay, we are looking at a total of three speakers. And our first speaker will be Julie Shanson, followed by Catherine. Hi, uh, thank you, City Council. Can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Excellent. So I really appreciated this breakdown of what's before you for capital improvement projects. And I know you got a letter today from um, Menlo Together uh, encouraging you to look at the priorities that come out of the environmental justice element. I just want to echo that and say that the um, improve 
the area of the city that's been had deferred maintenance um, the longest has been area, the area of the Bellhaven neighborhood. And so I would like you to consider that as a weighting factor when you're looking at what to complete this year and what not to complete this year. Please prioritize uh, improvements that happen in the Bellhaven neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Catherine, followed by Karen Grove. Good evening, Council. This is Catherine Dumont, Menlo Park resident, and um, I uh, wanted to th thank the uh, staff for this report, um, the 2024-2029 um, Capital Improvement Plan. And it's great to see funding for projects that support active transportation infrastructure, climate resilience, and housing on city-owned parking lots. I think one of the big misses um, that um, I noted that I see is that um, uh, there's no mention of bike lanes and related safety infrastructure on El Camino Real. Um, and um, this is a miss, real would be a real missed opportunity, not a, a huge um, investment of money, but um, uh, very timely because of the Caltrans uh, repaving that's going on along the entire length of El Camino. Uh, 10 years ago, Menlo Park had a vision for bike lanes and um, even completed a million dollar study with strong public support for removing parking and installing bike lanes. Um, now, 10 years later, we have more um, um, neighbors, more um, traffic, and I think it's it's uh, time to revisit that um, out of, say, um, like 19 of the cities along the El Camino Real corridor, 15 of them are moving forward with plans for bike lanes. Our neighbors to the south, Los Altos and Mountain View, um, Palo Alto, and North um, Atherton is doing a study um, and uh, Redwood City has some quick build projects. So it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a project that um, will um, meet, that moves us towards the um, priorities of um, addressing uh, climate change, taking action and um, improving quality of life. Um, and it's an equity issue for the folks who need to use El Camino on by foot or by bike or by bus, it gives them a safer um, way of getting around on a major north-south corridor. It's the only continuous north-south corridor in our area. So I urge you to um, take another look at this. Let's not miss out on a once in 30 year opportunity to take advantage of Caltrans repaving dollars. Um, and we can negotiate with uh, Caltrans for design and inclusion of more high visibility pedestrian crossings and other desirable design improvements as they've been doing in Palo Alto. Thank you. And next is Karen Grove. Hello, thank you. Um, good evening. And I'm, I just, I, I wanna also echo the Menlo Together letter. Um, I'm gonna focus on the affordable housing, pro, you know, the housing element program 4GH, 4HG, the one about affordable housing on the parking lots. Um, in order to produce affordable housing, if you look at our history and if you look at other cities, it is really necessary to, um, to have a local city contribution of funds. Um, that makes us competitive for a lot more funds from state, county, and local um, sources. Um, and for example, and, and this may not be a, a CIP thing, but the reason I'm, I traditionally it hasn't been, but the reason I'm bringing it up now is that our BMR fund is fully allocated. Um, we once had $10 million in there that was sitting there a long time. 
Um, but we're in a good practice of allocating it on a regular basis. And so it is fully allocated. And it's not clear how quickly it will be refilled. Um, it used to be filled by commercial and housing fees because we were not allowed to require inclusionary BMR ho housing before the Palmer fix passed in 2018, I think. Um, so now it's just commercial development that contributes and it comes in big chunks when a project gets, I think, entitled as the trigger. Um, so that's really important to know what that forecast is. And if not, then I think at least in the back of your minds, you should be thinking about the fact that we're going to have to make a contribution that is significant. Um, and just a quick offer, I noticed that one of the things on the plan is Sharon Heights high voltage street lights or something. And I do not know what that is about, but I live in Sharon Heights and have not given a second thought to street lighting. Um, so just in case that's helpful. <laughs> and I'm sure my one voice is not going to make the difference on that, but I would throw that out there. Um, and since I have a few more seconds, I looked up some similar projects in nearby cities. Um, in Mountain View, Lot 12, I believe, the city contributed 4.5 million. And uh, San Mateo contributed 5.5 million and Oakland recently contributed 19.5 million. So um, we should be planning to contribute you know, significant sums. And also please check my my data. Um, I'm, I'm not a professional, but that's the idea. Thank you. Seeing no further hands or cards. Oh, apologies. Did have one additional hand raise. So our final speaker will be Pam Jones. Good evening, council and staff. Um, I sent you um, an email that made a very simple recommendation to, in order to guarantee funding for the environmental justice element and safety elements projects once that they're fully completed. And that is to redirect uh, 0.05% from the total for all the other projects. I think it was somewhere around 44 million. Um, and leverage some of that money with what you're already going to do that may be a part of the transportation or maybe a part of the um, uh, the environment, maybe one of the environment uh, processes. Um, we can do this. It just is going to mean being creative and thinking differently than we normally do. Um, you know, the, the CIP and the budget is very clear, and it's really nice to have a report like this. I really appreciate that. And I want to thank the staff. Um, but again, uh, let us think out of the box. Let us think a little bit differently than we normally do and consider just a percentage. And that can be um, done in a number of ways, given that we have uh, the number of projects that we have, I think was seven. I couldn't pull the page up quick enough. At any rate, um, thank you very much. And that's all I need to say. Okay, seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Taylor, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron, and thank you for all the public comment that was just provided. I'm bringing it back to the council to see if there's anyone that would like to kick off the discussion. Councilmember Nash. So I have a question, and that is um, whether it makes sense to put the housing element on the list of plans that are being considered for priority. Um, it certainly seems like it would be a good idea, and also including the um, environmental justice and the safety element. Is there a reason why it was left, why it was not included? So the the CIP really focuses on granular projects as it relates to the uh, the housing element that will trigger um, improvements in the infrastructure as as the uh, the developments come in. And so that undergoes uh, those plan reviews take into account, um, you know, the infrastructure needs. So 
We did bring forward to you last week, for example, the water supply assessment. So we are um, we are looking at the needs and the next um, the next update on the urban water management plan, for example, will take into account the growth associated with the housing element. So these are not discrete, these are large plans, but the project implementation then is discrete and gets, um, gets incorporated into the CIP um, based on the infrastructure needs. I have a follow-up question on that. So I'm curious here, so it, it mentioned Safer Bay and other efforts to address flooding as well as uh, stormwater issues. And I could imagine that some of those will address environmental justice issues that have come up in the environmental justice element. So would you track that those are connected to the environmental justice and safety elements? Absolutely, these elements are guiding documents and in terms of assessing the needs, they're the guiding documents to then inform the projects that we will bring forward to then request funding for. That's, That's part of the strategy. That's very helpful. And I almost wonder if when this comes back to us, if there could be another column here that says which element or which part of our plans this connects to, if it's the housing element or if it's the EJ element, so we understand how the staff is tracking this connection. Yes. So one step that we have started to do on our master spreadsheets is to really for um for example, identify this project is a recommendation from a planning document. So we can, uh, we will definitely work at developing that much more uh, comprehensively. Can you also include the safety element on it as well? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um. First of all, thank you for all the work and I appreciate um, really how our city is using these planning documents to strategically look at the CIP. Um, I also want to just reflect, um, I've been coming to council meetings for I think like eight years or something and the gatehouse fence was a lingering CIP project that kind of like strung along year after year where it wasn't like a red hot priority, but it was something that kind of needed to be done. And I'm super excited when I drive down um, Ravenswood and to see it shining white and kind of completed and not deteriorating. So a lot of these things take time. This is more for members of the public and um, can just require some patience waiting for the right staff to be at the right place and the right opportunity. Um, I um, also want to just let the public know that each one of these items likely has a constituency that really cares about these <laughs> items. Um, and uh, so it is hard to kind of think about removing something or bumping something. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, one thing that has been in my mind um, since our goal setting really, actually over the last couple of years, are these like projects that kind of live nowhere, but that are um, not high level priorities, but are kind of like one off. So I might be thinking about um, the sound wall um, by Kelly Park or um, additional pickleball court capacity or um, um, the El Camino Real bike lane issues that could be potential CIPs. Um, and like, I think a lot of us well, I want El Camino Real bike lanes, but I'll take one less potentially controversial um, sound wall by Kelly Park. I don't know if there's anyone against that. Um, so how, so my understanding is if it's not in the CIP, then it will not be worked on in the next five year period. And so where does that project kind of live and how and when, if ever, does it rise to the level that somebody is funding it and planning to work on it? Yes, great question. Uh, specific to for the example on the sand walls, our proposal, we have our parks minor program, and we also have our sport field um, program as well. So as you will see, we have been changing the project descriptions in uh, in the uh, proposal 
to then include improvements such as noise. So looking at things more comprehensively in terms of our needs for our sport fields, part of that being um, in sport courts, part of that being noise mitigation. So we, uh, we, we listen, part of it is programming since we have 64 projects. So part of it is do we, so one of the things that we did this year, we had um, many little tiny water projects, for example. So, and they don't compare in scale to, you know, great separation. I, I don't think anything compares in scale to great separation. Um, you know, so maybe that's a that's a that's not a great example, but we are trying to consolidate our projects so that we are approaching this on a program basis. And part of the, the scope of work will include, for example, on that noise mitigation. And we will report out to you our funding, existing funding that we have and new needs based on the uh, the projects included under that program, so they're not they're not lost. They are being tracked um, on a program basis on these um, the programs that we have that to improve the existing infrastructure. So, I'm a little confused about what it means to be a program. Then maybe the differentiation between the program and the project. This is kind of the the whole right. thing that kind of scrambles my brain a little bit. So the um, the sound using the sound wall as an example, that's great that it's being thought holistically in terms of like activity fields and um, and parks. So when does the staff or when does the council or the community review those programs? Is that part of like the parks and rec master plan like review process or how does that I guess if I'm a champion of the sound wall, um, how and how do I get that attend? How do I get that to have attention, or where do I get to assert? How, how does staff know when to work on it and what to invest in it? Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Wilson. Um, so Nikki Nagaya, De Deputy City Manager, and um, I think in this particular case, one of the other um, funding buckets I think is is worth noting here is the, the community amenities program. And so um, as part of the development efforts in um, the Bayfront zoning districts, when um, projects have come forward with bonus level development, they're paying into a community amenities fund. And so that money has been accumulating over the last several years. And so one of the items that was called out in the staff report, but isn't highlighted in um, the tables right now with the funding proposals is an effort to do more community engagement and make sure that we have an implementation plan for, for that funding. So I think um, that's one particular quote unquote program, but we're, I think we've already done a lot of engagement through both um, the, the prior efforts around community amenities with the subcommittees work, we, we know we've heard a lot about the things that are desired, but what we need to do next is develop that implementation plan to get from high level ideas to um, numbers on a page that you're actually appropriating funds towards and um, being able to scope scope those projects out in more detail. So that's, I think, one example where because there's funding that's accumulated, um, the real constraint is staffing. And so we're, we're looking at completing BHCC uh, as a major milestone this week. Um, there will be inevitably some, some follow-up items for our capital team to, to complete, um, but that's a major turning point when um, getting the building completed, we'll be able to then shift those resources to, to other efforts, one of which might be uh, implementation of the community amenities uh, plan. Thanks. And following up on um, like El Camino bike lanes and sidewalks on middle, is it fair to say that if one or both of those were added to the CIP list, that something would have to fall off the list that's on there? In, indeed. What we are presenting to you is actually um, a plan that one, you saw the vacancies that we have. Our goal is obviously to fill them. We have quite a few uh, efforts that will require uh, staff to really tackle, such as the funding needs as it relates to water, tra transportation, and, uh, and the ongoing Safer Bay. 
So we are proposing to you a plan that uh, we hope to be successful in as long as we fill these vacancies. Yes, I totally appreciate that. I'm just doing this also more for um, constituency education. So then my question becomes for El Camino Real bike lanes, for example, I know that the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition this past weekend did a ride and there's a lot of people in different cities um, trying to move forward that. Does Menlo Park have a timeline of when we would even be looking at that? Because um, Caltrans is about to repave kind of south of us but when is their repaving coming um, to our area? And then is the idea that that would be revisited as a CI, potential CIP to, to be ready for that? Yeah, so I, I can um, chime in on this one. So I was the project manager for the study that Ms. Dumont spoke about uh, in 2013. And um, at the time that that was completed, the direction we got from the council was um, to prioritize the crossings of El Camino as opposed to the north-south route, while we then um, monitor and engage with our neighbors and make sure that um, what we may construct on El Camino isn't just an isolated bike lane within Menlo Park, but part of a regional system. The Caltrans efforts to repave in Santa Clara County do end at the county line and do not include um, Menlo Park or sections north into San Mateo for what's currently on the horizon right now. El Camino Real in Menlo Park was last repaved um, about um, 15 years ago. So their efforts to overhaul and repave here are, are a number of years off uh, at this point. Um, but we are partnering with Atherton. We're an active stakeholder participant in their study, which does extend all the way south to Valparaiso, where we share right of way of, of El Camino. Uh, within our jurisdiction. So we're continuing to, to monitor and be, be engaged in those discussions. Um, but really our priorities over the last 10 years have been implementing the Oak Grove bike lanes, um, implementing uh, the bike lane gap closure on Ravenswood as you lead into El Camino Real. Both of those efforts have been constructed. And then we have in, uh, in the CIP efforts for crossing improvements at, uh, for pedestrians at Ravenswood and Sinal and Robo Avenues as well. So that, that's that been our focus, um, but we're continuing to be engaged in the, the north-south kind of bike lane projects as well. Thanks, I'll let others ask some questions. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Willison. I have a, a question um, regarding the projects where we have to pay up front and we receive a reimbursement. Uh, do you know how many projects there are where that's required? So um, we have in attachment C, we've identified those projects that have um, have grants and most of these grants are on a reimbursement basis. So Safer Bay, for example, is a large one. That's a $50 million grant. And so that is an example. Um, we are working on some of these transportation projects. We're actually working with the transportation authority to um, for them to lead some of the project management. So as part of the grants, they would actually keep the grant funding and use it toward the project. So there wouldn't be this going back and forth in terms of you know reimbursement. That's not to, um, we still have a matching needs, but uh, but we are working with them on on streamlining some of that, that the, pro the grant management process. Thank you. Um, Anna. And it's 16 grants. And there's 16. Or 16 you. projects. 16 projects. Yes. And my, my next question is, for the, since Council Member Willison used this as an example, the um, the wall, the sound wall, is it possible to apply for any of the Department of Transportation funding for the wall? Yeah, so we, we have been monitoring the funding opportunities. I think um, one of the sources that we were closely tracking was the Reconnecting Communities uh, yeah. funding uh, program through uh, federal um, federal sources. And so I think um, overall possible, those sources have been highly competitive. And so we're not certain that we will be successful, but but those are... Um, uh, that's one of the, the likely sources that may be able to provide some some funding. Do you think, and, and I'm not sure if this uh, law became effective at January 1st or, or June 1st, and that is Justice 40 and how projects are 
or mandated to be prioritized that are related to environmental justice? Um, yeah, I don't know the the effective date either, but um, I, I think as I understood um, uh, Justice 40, it's a strategy that, that all or most of the um, uh, federal grant programs are using to ensure that they are allocating resources to um, neighborhoods that have been underserved or underfunded in, in the past. And so I think, um, yeah, in that context, uh, all the DOT grants, I think, are, are using that framework. Okay. So it's possible that the sound wall would fall into that under that category. So yes, I, okay. I, I think so. Um, but we, we'd have to do a, a close read of the, the grant requirements. Um, I think as we've looked at the Reconnecting Communities program, it, it seems that um, large infrastructure or holistic infrastructure plans or programs are the things that may, may compete the best as opposed to individual projects um, like a, a, a sound wall alone. I think they're really looking for like a, a package of, of things. So um, that's something that, that we can take a, a closer closer look at. Thank you. And just to continue the discussion around funding, the BRIC grant, is that annual? Is that something the city of Menlo Park can apply for again? Or do we have to wait a certain amount of time? Yes, that the program, uh, we were lucky to be awarded the BRIC grant um, in their first round of funding, the first year of its existence. Um, it is generally an annual to biannual call that they put out. But I think our likelihood of success, given that we've been awarded um, a prior large uh, sum, um, is is probably something that we need to think think about. Um, so it doesn't say we're not precluded from applying, um, but I think um, our chances of an award um, are, are probably um, less likely than than a neighboring city that hasn't been awarded. And for the brick grant, I know there's different areas you can apply for. So I don't know if that's a, a factor. Um, I think there's a communications infrastructure. I don't have the paper in front of me, but there's different categories you can apply for. Does that make a difference as far as one city exhausting one category versus they just look at it all the same? Um, that's a good question. So I think, like, like I said earlier, there, there's nothing in the FEMA grant requirements or, or guidelines that are, it would preclude us from from applying. Um, I think um, it's more a, a matter of assessing the com how competitive our application would be for for what we sub submit for. Um, and yeah, as, as you said, there are there are a number of things um, that they will provide funding support for, but. Um, um, it's more a matter of, um, I think, like in the first round of, of funding that we received in 2020, um, or were, were initially um, identified for in 2020, um, the the number we we were um, the largest funding award in the entire U.S. and um, uh, also had the, the kind of private partner. Uh, funding leverage as well. So, um, yeah, nothing that would preclude us from applying again. We just would want to assess the, the competitiveness of the application. Thank you. Uh, my next question, I'm actually just going off of the presentation. I uh, just wanted to find out about the school. I think it was La Entrada. The plague, is it the sports field renovation? Is this, is it something that the city, the school is also providing funding for, or is the city paying for the whole project? Uh, there is a funding agreement with the school district, but we, we lead the project. Okay. Thank you. And for the, under the environment part of the presentation, how many electric vehicle charges does the $600,000 cover? you give me a moment, I have that okay. information. Thank you. And in all fairness, I did not submit any questions ahead of time.
just a part B to the question is in what level are they? I, I will have to get back to you. I actually um, had the number right in, uh, but I, I will have to follow up on the actual number. We were assessing uh, the um, the parking lot right here. And then the uh, I think the courtyard has two and then the additional number by um, by the gym. But I'll have to get back to you on the total number. Thank you. And just a, I, the way I'm thinking about this, are we... Are we looking to have the same number of chargers as we do electric vehicles? Is that the goal, or is it half? No. Is so, it... so the the um, great thing about electric vehicles is one, their charging capacities are increasing rapidly. Uh, a lot of it depends on the department and the use. So, we would actually have a charging uh, management software that would then inform us if we have to charge a vehicle once a week or every three days. So no, luckily uh, there have been a lot of improvements on the vehicle front. So we need fewer charging facilities than, you know, so it's not a one-to-one. -one. We can actually optimize and um, be much more effective with our, the capital needs on the charging front. And thank you. And the charging management software is included in the cost or is it additional? I would have, it's now, it's sort of, um, I'll have to assess if that was included, but it's now part of just like what what we need to actually operate the system and okay. manage. So it would be an incremental cost if it's not included in the, uh, in the, uh, the request, but it, it's nominal compared to the infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Any uh, council member door? Yes, following up on the mayor's question about La Entrada, I have a question. Um, I know previously earlier this year, was it last year, we heard from Bell Haven Elementary School about a big redo on the, the park and the yard and, and the buildings there. And I was curious if um, what, where that fits in here and how Menlo Park is going to be involved, if that's on our list. I haven't had a chance to review that, but it just came to mind. Yeah, so I think the construction at Bell Haven Elementary is underway, um, and we've been having conversations with school district officials about um, what kind of partnership opportunities may exist, but those are pretty early in, in the process. Their construction timeline is is um, first to uh, redo the buildings, and then they'll follow up with the, the um, open space and kind of um, uh, parks and kind of um, play structure areas uh, to follow. So I think there there will be opportunities for partnerships related to um, to Bellhaven School fields as well. Um, and we'll also need to renegotiate the use agreements um, with the school like we have with the um, Las Lumitas and, and MPCSD as well. Okay, but right now it sounds like there's no funding in here that's allocated towards supporting that project. That's correct, because um, there's still some additional work that needs to be done to scope out exactly what that would look like as we go go forward. Okay, thank you. Um, a question that I am reflecting from one of the emails we received in advance. Uh, efforts, you mentioned Vision Zero, and one of the efforts we just talked about last week was creating the permanent bike lanes, buffered bike lanes, and changes near the Nilon Park. Where is that reflected here in the in the CIP proposal? So it's under the Middle Avenue Complete Streets Project. So Great. that includes the um, uh, traffic calming, modifications, the pilot, as well as the resurfacing. Great, thank you. I also have some some opinion, if we're moving from questions, I do have some, some thoughts I would love to share, but also wanna leave room for questions if others have questions still. Thank you. You may proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, on on the theme of parking, um, I know in here under streets and sidewalks, the plaza renovations for plaza seven and eight are on hold. And in conversation with staff, it seems like moving that forward would help in the process to then also look at the downtown parking lots and figure out which ones are we focusing on for, for development um, and 
because of the connection there. Could, first, I'd love a confirmation of, is there a connection between improving and updating clauses seven and eight and this effort to move forward with an RFQ or RFP process with the parking lots? Are these connected at all? And would moving that forward help the, the process for affordable housing in the parking lots? We are working with our city manager on taking a strategic and comprehensive approach. So we, uh, we've we been working working um, closely on identifying the lots that would be more amenable to housing than that leaves. We do have funding for Plaza 7 um, and it's really uh, solidifying then the parking needs to assess when then we we take a look at the timeline as well as it relates to the existing conditions. but. We, we want to make sure that there's um, there that we have been coordinating with our city manager, with our planning team to then assess the uh, there are two efforts, one, the restoration of the, the plazas as well as the um, parking lot, down, downtown parking lot assessment. So we're coordinating. Thank you. And this actually raises another question for me. Um, last year when we had the Berkeley graduate students presents their proposal for how to have housing and parking and everything, all the needs met downtown. Um, I believe in both of the models they created, there was a parking structure. And as we think about projects like this to do a renovation, um, would that be followed five or three years later, let's say, by taking away that parking lot and building a parking structure if needed to replace parking downtown? Um, and so I'm curious if I know this is all hypothetical because we don't have an RFP, we don't have a parking garage proposed, but I, I am curious about timelines, if there is any, um, how close those timelines might be in a, in a feasible hypothetical world. Uh, let's see. So I, I think the, the basic message for this evening it would be that there needs to be a, a separate um, kind of council study session specific on downtown to work through those things. Um, uh, as a, for instance, though, if there's, um, identify that there's a need, desire um, for structured parking, uh, that will be expensive. So that's that's like the important thing, kind of, kind of takeaway, um, as depending on the amount of land that's consumed for uh, housing development, that's going to be displacing parking. There's most likely going to be a need to replace that parking. The extent of the replacement is subject to some some debate, but the um, to put parking into some amount of structure is going to be very expensive. So that that all needs to to um, come together with that sort of comprehensive view. It's difficult to move forward with one discrete decision. Uh, on, on some, some various things like moving forward with the redo of Plaza 7, we think is premature right this second. <laughs> uh, after that council study session, I uh, I believe personally that um, Plaza 7, as an example, the one next to Trader Joe's, would be one that the city would be well served to uh, redo as is. There's other plazas that have uh, greater potential for uh, whether it's uh, residential development or parking structure, Plaza 7 is likely not to be one of those. But we don't want to move forward with Plaza 7 until we have that comprehensive discussion with the council and the community. Thank you for that explanation. Great. Um, and still would... Just following up on that, do we have a... Is, is that a study session that's in the works or is that a... I'd say it's in, in the works. What when it's going to happen? I, I I do not know. All things considered, it's most likely not going to be till uh, late summer. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I will stop there. Thank you, Councilmember Door. Councilmember Nash. So I have very similar questions. Um, sort of following along that same line. Is there any way to speed up the downtown parking lot study? I know that there's no additional funding being requested this year. Is there any way to, you know, would more funding make the project go faster? Or is it something where there's just um, finding the consultants, doing the RQ, all of that is on a set timeline and there's really no way to expedite that? Uh, we need to fill fill the vacant positions. That would be. This is a, a transportation project. Um, we've been working very closely, like I said, with our city manager and also our um, 
CDD, our planning um, group. And so it will be a joint effort, but uh, it's key for us to fill the positions in the transportation group. And I do have an answer on the EV chargers. Great. So found it. So two at the, um, uh, a total of 10 at Burgess and two at the corporation yard. Thank you for the information. And are those level, what level? Level two. They are level two. Thank you. Following up, uh, I appreciate that we need staff and we need vacancy. We need to fill these vacancies. And so hope if anyone's listening, excited about transportation that they consider applying. Um, but I, I want to check too, because I've had some helpful conversations with folks. Uh, there's the Kiki Kiku Crossing, some other projects that instead of using a formal RFP process, they used an RFQ or RFI or RFO process that uh, provided some elemental ideas out to the consultants of, I, I know that's a conversation we need to have first with the council about how many units, uh, what's the size, et cetera, um, but that some of the feasibility study could be wrapped up in the request for qualifications or interests that uh, nonprofit developers or affordable housing developers bring back to us. And I'm curious if that's a process that city staff is considering to help expedite the process once you have staff on hand. Yes, so absolutely. We actually have some familiarity with the Kiku Crossing. So we are looking at uh, quite a few options. I was also, um, if you could explain very briefly about the street light, it is not up at Sharon Heights. It, my understanding is it's on Windsor Drive and Robert S. Drive in um, Menlo is where we're talking about right now. And that it's because it's a series. Um, I'll let you explain. Yes. Just these are high voltage circuits. Uh, they um, one the infrastructure as it relates to transformers. Many of those are just obsolete, very difficult to replace. Uh, there's a safety component uh, that we're concerned about. So the uh, so they do need to be replaced with, um, and we'll take the opportunity there also to uh, change out the street lights to LED. But these do not have to be high voltage. I'm very supportive of that. I hear regularly from constituents that it is a problem. They do not have street lights. So thank you. Uh, I had a question on the police radio replacement, and I don't know if this is appropriate, but I will ask, um, is three years, phasing it in in three years uh, appropriate, or is it something that to me it sounded um, like we might want to do it faster? We can certainly work with our police department. They're leading that effort, their assessment right now. We uh, we are doing upgrades to the, uh, the HVAC system. So they were waiting for that project to to be completed so that they, then they could start the, the radio replacement. They did note that it was a two-year effort, um, but we can follow up with them and see if, if it could be done faster. And that would come back to us as part of the budget. Um, great. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to echo uh, something that Council Member Willison shared about the El Camino uh, projects or opportunities for bike lanes there uh, and echo my support and hope that we can ex get to that at some point uh, when, when they're doing repaving or hopefully sooner because I know that's a long ways out. And something that I'm thinking about in the context of our conversation was it last week or the time before where we heard that the uh, middle undercrossing is actually going to be $62 million, 60 max, max. Uh, but seeing just how big that is and how long it will take to do that, it makes me wonder, could we at the same time also improve bike infrastructure along our section of El Camino so, you know, in the meantime, we have a safer, cheaper option for folks to safely bike from, from Burgess Park to West Menlo and vice versa. Um, and I, I'm not suggesting that we add this to the list now because I know this is far off, but um, 
I, I just want to express my concerted desire to see us move forward on that uh, in conversation with Caltrans. Thank you. Councilmember Nash. I had one more question and um, which has been raised um, by several people before, and that was just how do we get the um, extension of the middle avenue sidewalks onto the list? Is that under one of the, is that being grouped under one of the other projects like the sidewalk repairs? It doesn't really sound like it was, or is that a unique project? It, it is a you it would be a unique project um just like the effort on Santa Cruz Avenue the uh the sidewalks you know, state law uh we are not not uh required to build sidewalks we take uh, the opportunities when new projects come to us through the plan review process and we condition um, development to build them we do address the uh, tripping tripping hazards as it relates to city city trees, and we address you know hazards that we get notified. But we currently do not have a plan to actually address all the uh, sidewalk gaps because of the uh, the responsibility and the cost. So this CIP does not include new sidewalks. I will be hopeful it makes it on next year. Thank you. Yeah, and maybe just to, to clarify, um, so when the council um, had adopted the, um, or provided direction on the next steps for the middle complete streets project in the fall of 2022, um, we did a cost estimate for what it would take to close the gaps on um, the north side of, of Middle Ave. And it's about 300, sorry, 3,000 feet of sidewalk and using some other recent projects um, that we've completed, it's roughly $4 million. Um, and that's just for the sidewalk um, gap closures that would not be reconstructing curbs and um, kind of making everything look uniform and incomplete. That's just the gap closure. And since there is a continuous facility on um, the other side of the street already, excuse me, I think I misspoke that the existing sidewalks on the north side, the south side is where the gaps are. Um, so it's around $4 million, and um, there are a number of utility poles and large heritage trees that would need to be removed if we proceeded with that project. So given all the complexity and the short-term needs for uh, the Complete Streets project, it's not currently in the, the CIP um, and would be a multi-year effort, uh, we would anticipate, because there's sidewalk completion projects don't compete well for grants, so it's most likely going to need to be locally funded as well. Thank you, that's very helpful. As people are building, are they being required to complete the sidewalks in front of their property? Generally, yes. Um, there, It depends on the scope of exactly what they're building, um, but for the most part, uh, a um, complete renovation of the home does trigger the need for frontage improvement um, uh, requirements along the uh, improving the sidewalks. That would be great. Um, I am aware of several projects um, in the area that were not required, even though they were complete um, rebuilds. So whatever we can do to emphasize that, that getting a sidewalk, that's would be helpful. Thank you. Council Member Doerr. Thank you. I know at the beginning, before the tables in the agenda packet, the city staff called out three areas where special financial planning and evaluation of funding options would be needed around water, stormwater, and transportation for the Middle Avenue Caltrain crossing and also for the Caltrain grade separation. And I was curious if you all have a sense or ideas for that financial planning or options that we should be considering, or at, at what point will, will there be space for that kind of conversation to talk about what's needed to move these discrete, very large projects forward? Yes, the, these processes are highly uh, highly involved city council as well as the public uh, options to finance. Uh, on the waterfront, for example, we do have state revolving loans that we can apply for. On stormwater, there are um, property related fees that we can assess. That effort typically you know, involves quite um, gauging the willingness to pay from property owners. But there are quite a few options, so the step would be for us to hire a consultant to assess the options and then uh, 
present those to you through a study session to then obtain direction on which options are the most viable. Thank you. I have a, a couple more questions and then we can actually put up the, I think it was the last slide about direction requested. Um, and this is on capital project delivery staffing. This is page nine. So just wanted to find out um, if you have listed on here the Safe Routes to School program and if there are, are a list of items that you have program items or are they more around um, capital improvement? Like, is it infrastructure? So in terms of your feedback, it, it is focused on infrastructure. Okay. Know? And is this a partnership with the school districts or is this something the city's doing on its own or is it just the school district? Um, are, the, are you inquiring about the Safe Routes to School program? Like what the scope of that is? Yeah, yes. And it, does it include infrastructure? Yes. Yeah. Yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> so it's a comprehensive program um, where stakeholders from each of the um, local schools meet with staff and the consultant who's supporting the program that we've brought in uh, a number of years ago and uh, covers um, both education um, encouragement programs and infrastructure. So those um, particular staff people leading the effort and the consultant aren't generally the ones uh, designing or building the infrastructure, but they relay that feedback back to the, the others on the, the uh, staff team. And because we have multiple school districts, how does that work? Do you prioritize school districts or is it only school districts that engage directly with the city on their own or is there outreach to each school district? Yeah, there, there's outreach to each of the school districts and there's a, a monthly um, a task force meeting that all the districts are invited to participate in. Um, and I think we've had varied um, participation in, in the past. It kind of varies year to year which schools are the most active, but we, we do have contacts and engagement with each of the districts as well. Okay, thank you. And my last question, I believe on this, um, is how does it work with the charter schools, the schools that are renting from the school district, but are not necessarily a part of the district? Um, so good question. Um, generally, we have safe routes to school, su suggested route maps for each of those schools um, that are located within Menlo Park, regardless of whether they're a charter school, a private okay. school, a public school. Um, all of those are currently shown on, on the city's website. Um, in terms of then direct engagement, um, most of the engagement with the current charter schools happens through um, the district that they're leasing from for, for them for the most part. So just on a practical basis, that's that's where we're hearing um, most of the, the feedback um, from our public school partners uh, across the, the, the three primary districts, uh, Las Lomitas, MPCSD, and, and Ravenswood City Schools. Okay, I, I bring this up because I drive past KIPP, which is located at Willow Oak School at least three days a week around traffic hour. And I'm not sure because I have not looked at the safe routes map if what is act, what activities are actually happening around safe routes at that school. But most importantly, I'm hoping that there is some type of infrastructure project on the horizon just because of the level of traffic, the speed, and then most of the cars I see are turning left from Willow into the school. So which means they have to wait and then coming out, there's also a challenge there. And I know there's another exit out of the school, not sure if that is accessible to parents, um, but there's just a lot of volume of traffic there. So, let's see. And then my next question is just about, and this is referring to one of the public comments about allocating funding, a percentage of funding, um, just to make sure that there is like this marker, and I know Ms. Mitch, you did say what is already being done around the environmental justice element and safety element and how to include it in CIP. Um, does it make sense to allocate some funding from CIP to make sure it's like a placeholder 
or something we know that's coming? Yeah, so I think this this is a good question um, and one that I think we, we may need to have a little bit more internal discussions on to bring you back some recommendations as to how to best um, plan for the funding for environmental justice and safety element implementation. But um, earmarking a certain percentage of the capital fund, what, what you really would be doing um, uh, is earmarking a percentage of you know, the 20 odd funds they contribute towards capital resources. And some of those have very specific legal nexus requirements that we need to, to track. And so without going through fund by fund, um, it, it's a hard answer to um, provide um, at a, a very high level. So I think we need to do a little bit more homework, um, sit down with our, our legal team and our finance teams and, and understand what our options may be. Um, and we can certainly think about some ways to put together a funding strategy, a, an implementation plan uh, for those um, efforts coming forward uh, to you hopefully next month. But um, the uh, earmarking just a percentage from each of the funds um, does need a little bit more investigation before we can can give you a, a really complete answer. Thank you, Mr. Gaia. And I see an EJ fund on the horizon, possibly. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Dorr? Yes, on environmental justice element and how to fund that work. I know over the last year, I've been a broken record on the, the value of using hopefully a grant writer to help us go after funds that have Justice 40, justice 40 requirements um, that support uh, a lot of the projects that are being proposed in the EJ element. And I, I wanted to check in. I know that there has been a grant writer that's working with you all. Is there a current focus on that grant writer looking at environmental justice, climate justice related projects, or will there be that focus moving forward? Yeah, we have given the grant writer an overview of most of the major areas that we're <clears throat> looking at in terms of work streams right now. Um, environmental justice, I think, will ramp up after we finalize the plan and then can move into implementation a little more. Um, they're definitely looking at that topic as well as climate adaptation and, res and resiliency. Um, and they work directly with our sustainability and um, community development staff on, on those. That's great to hear. Because I, I know that through the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act, there are just so many funds open right now and that have been going out, out the door uh, in the last year that it would be great to see if there are any options or opportunities for our community. Thank you. Council Member Willison. Thank you. Um, I think you mentioned, um, I'm happy to hear that we're using the grant writer. I think a lot of this comes down to funding. Um, and I do think it would be helpful at some point to have a council discussion on kind of the balance between um, grant writing, um, you know, generating, you know, revenue for like the water, um, like, how are we going to fund all these things in the long term? Um, we talk a lot about um, our operating budget and, you know, how we need to balance the budget every year um, and how one-time money is kind of for one-time uses. Um, so I think we're, we have to be able to kind of walk and chew bubble gum at the same time, both looking at our operating revenue, our operating stream and our structural needs. Um, and so I just think as we move forward, I think the council would be helpful for us to, to have some discussions around that, um, since it sounds like we have a lot of large needs coming up in the years ahead. And then I think, you know, the three things to get anything done are kind of like the money, the capacity, and then the political will, and then that can help prioritize things. Um, I do have like comments on some things. Is now the appropriate time? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm always reluctant at this stage to kind of add new things or take things off um, because I know this is like a very delicate um, puzzle we're putting together here. Um, one thing I'm hoping maybe isn't too much of a, a lift and wouldn't bump things off um, is the bike rack um, comments, not like a, a theoretical bike rack, but actual bike racks. <laughs> um, this has been something that's been brought up um, recently in some of the emails we got and also over the years, I know that um, when I go visit many places in our city, um, there's a lack of bike parking. 
Um, and also I know in, in front of Walgreens where the kids congregate, those bike racks are in a really not ideal location. Um, so um, I don't know if there's an opportunity to have like a bike rack master plan or something, but I, I do feel like the bike parking situation in our city needs some attention. And I would be curious to hear what, if, if we wanted to address that, what the impact and bumping would be on, on other things. And is there a way to kind of flip that in? Um, and then other than that, um, you know, I'm really happy to see um, lots of transportation um, projects continue to be on this list, especially since we have the safe streets priority. Um, I'm excited um, that we're kind of moving on from the, the discussions around middle sidewalks aside um, and uh, focusing now potentially on, on middle field. There's a great need at Woodland and Middlefield and Willow at Middlefield and, and that project. So I'm happy to see that. I really want um, to see that go and, and get the attention it needs. Another project um, that's on this list, but I'm not sure if everyone's aware of the status of this is the Coleman Ringwood study. Um, so the county is leading a Coleman Ringwood project and um, there may be some movement at the county on getting a pilot going on their side of the project. And then I just wanna make sure that if and when that pilot takes place on the county side, that the city is also kind of ready. And that <clears throat> right now the way it's listed on this list is kind of um, about the study, but um, you know things could potentially move fast with the county um, being ready to pilot their portion. And I just wanna make sure that there's nothing in here precluding from the city uh, that the council would have needed to do at this stage so that the city can act on doing kind of our share of any pilot that would take place. Um, and other than that, um, yeah, I, I like I said, I mostly wanna just kind of go forward and 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 get this work done. And I, I always worry that kind of us um, tinkering from the dais just kind of creates roadblocks and, and time. Um, so I'm hoping that the only thing I've kind of thrown out there is the bike rack thing. And I'm curious if you have a reaction to that. And I see I, Council Member Nash nodding or questioning or wanting to speak maybe, I'm not sure. Making a lot of eye contact, but you don't, I can't see your face. <laughs> so, yeah. I think the bike rack is a, um, the Complete Streets Commission is a perfect place for the bike rack and maybe coming up with proposals um, given our staff capacity at this point, especially, um, and perhaps, and also their intimate knowledge of the city. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm just curious um, if we wanted bike rack attention sooner than later to actually happen. I agree that there might be some planning that needs to happen. Like, what would that look like in terms of? this process. So recently we've heard, we actually a few months ago had a meeting with the, um, with the youth advisory commission and asked them for feedback on locations. Uh, they, they did give us some feedback. Um, we also heard last week on about Neilan park and needing additional bike parking. So this is something that we can fold into our operations assessing and yes we can take this back to the complete streets commission and and get um get more comprehensive feedback and develop a plan i have a follow-up question does it require less work or more work to have it referred to a commission it's always more work but it's great work yes because we can we uh often it's very nice to listen to the feedback and there may be just things that we we uh we could have missed so we can always receive their feedback work with them on developing a plan and then um and report out on the installation of additional bike racks thank you council member willison yeah i think that's really exciting um i also think it gives the public an opportunity in a forum to uh, weigh in. I know like coffee bar for, as an example, I'm often like tethering my bike to like, I don't know if it's a tree or a pole. Um, so if I were a member of the public and I saw it on the complete streets agenda, I could then, you know, weigh in or something, but I hope it's not a multi-year <laughs> process. Um, and, uh, I just think it's something that's kind of, it's one of those things that kind of, it's like the gatehouse is <laughs> just kind of like always out there, but just kind of needs the attention. Thank you. I'm excited to hear it could potentially just be rolled into operations. 
Thank you, Councilmember Wilson. Councilmember Doerr. Thank you. I want to echo support for seeing bike racks, bike racks move forward in an expeditious way, and we'll defer to staff's decision about the best way to move that forward uh, in a quick, quick, helpful way. Uh, two, given what the uh, city manager shared about Plaza 7 renovations, I think I'd like to see that move from on hold to, I guess, would that be planning at the start of that process? Um, one thing I'm curious about with other folks, uh, with other folks in the dais is about stormwater work, um, in conversation with city staff. I wonder about the, the timeline on that, given other things on your priority list. Is that something that you feel like you can meaningfully take on this year? Is that something that feels like it requires more time and just was curious for a quick bit of feedback? For the stormwater funding assessment, we actually um, have the request for uh, for proposals written, um, finalized. It's just a matter of then having the staff to work with the consultant, but we are hoping to do that this fiscal year. Okay, perfect. Then I have no comment to make on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Nash. So I agree with the comments that have been made. I think the staff report, um, and I agree with what's um, going on in the staff, the staff report proposal. I actually um, had heard that we wanted to wait on Plaza 7 until we got the, so I will leave it to staff, but I, um, whether or not it makes sense to move, I think we do want to move whenever it's appropriate. Um, but I certainly would prioritize the downtown parking lot study and getting that, um, whatever we can do to move the housing projects forward. Yeah, um, I, sorry, Here, please. please. Um, th thank you, I, I think our general approach in order to move forward with the downtown parking lot study is to seek some initial feedback from the council through that study session. We think that the likely recommendation or the, the likely um, scenarios that we could lay out will lead to Plaza 7 being able to proceed as a, a more immediate next step, but we I think that study session would um, be um, the first first step. Can I chime in just one question based on that? Is Plaza 8's the one by Walgreens? Okay, so my my husband's kind of like man on the street, <laughs> like um, he's not tapped into all this, and he's he often gives me feedback like these are terrible. These parking lots are they're terrible. So assuming we come out of the study session and it's pretty clear that we're not going to be kind of touching those parking lots with housing, how soon will potentially repaving of those lots? Because it's like an, un, is it a wire out? Oh utility undergrounding project too? Just, I know a lot of members of the public have commented on the 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 quality of those pavings. And I just want to give people a sense of when they might see those repaved. If if that's the council direction not to pursue those with housing and everything. So if we receive direction, um, it is uh, most likely a two-year process in terms of working through the designs, evaluating the undergrounding, much public outreach as well, assessing um, maybe a different uh, method of paving to make it faster or more environmentally sensitive, uh, incorporating green infrastructure, and then um, and then the uh, the bidding and construction. So it would be a two two year process. Is there nothing we can do now for like some of those pothole repairs, like temporary fixes? Yes, I mean we have. Uh, the wet weather is never a friend to the pavement. So we um, we have been doing some minor repairs and we'll continue to do so. Some are beyond what can be done, um, but we'll continue to assess and have our maintenance crews repair as they can. Thank you. And the parking lot um, renovations were actually on last year's CIP budget and they've actually been moved on to hold because of this study. Is that Correct. Good. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I agree. I I think all of us here in experience um, the deterioration of the parking lot, um, but certainly um, 
the housing as a priority, I think, again, for everyone. Um, my concern, there was talk about grants and money and I'm um, other ways to fund projects. And while I support that, my biggest concern right now is implementation of the projects where we already have grant money and just making sure with the staff that we have that we can actually push those forward and succeed um, in getting those across the finish line, um, doing a good job using the money. Um, so whatever we can um, do there is great. I'm especially thinking of the electrification, um, building electrification, the 4.5 million where the deadline's coming up quite quickly. Although I realize that's not a capital project. Um, and then whatever we can do um, again with the bike racks in an incremental way, um, if it's possible not to wait for the entire plan, but actually just, we, there's some obvious places where more bike racks could be um, provided and would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. And thank you for all the work on this. Thank you, Councilmember Nash. Um, I definitely support the bike racks and then also the prioritizing project implementation that we already have funding for. And I am a huge supporter of parks. So definitely do not wanna delay anything that is in progress right now um, for parks. And then also, let's see. Did you actually want us to talk about projects to delay? or is what we just provided enough feedback for staff? This is great feedback. Um, we uh, we don't want to intentionally, intentionally delay projects, but wanted your assessment in terms of, you know, things that are on hold, um, maybe other projects that you might prioritize over, over um, others, so. But if this is this is great because we are proposing something that we hope to be successful on, given the uh, um, the plan to fill the the vacancies. Thank you. And do you need me to do a recap? I, I wrote things down, but the list is actually pretty short. Great. Yes, that would be great. All right. Um, if there are no more questions or comments for staff, did you want me to? Recap the list? Yes, that would be okay. great. Okay, we have uh, bike racks. Um, Council Member Willison, you brought up Willow. Let's see, I brought up the Middlefield project, making yeah. sure, that, I mean, it's on the list, just like giving it a thumbs up. The Coleman um, project, just making sure that whatever's in the CIP includes a potential pilot when the county's ready to go. Um, and that was it. And so then I think, I think that was it. Okay. Um, then we had bike racks for council member door and then also Plaza seven, which. I'm amenable to, to when it, when it needs to happen moving forward. And then also stormwater drain. No. Okay. Take stormwater. Drain. I also uh, mentioned in the next round of this, having a list of which element or plan the different items are connected to represented in the, uh, the files that are shared the agenda. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. And Council Member Nash, it was, she's good. I'm good. I mean, I'm also like the Middle Avenue crossing. So like, like the El Camino crossings, like just go forth. We're, we're happy. It sounds like. <laughs> Thank you for, for the recap and the feedback. Um, the, the two other things that I had noted were to come back to you on the police radio replacement, if that was um, something that we needed to expedite into to one more year instead of two more years. And then we already talked about the study session on, on downtown. So I think those were the, the other two follow-up items. Yes, and I think the, the other item was when you come back to have, to add in the chart, how it's connected to environmental justice and the safety element. Yes, absolutely. We'll add the elements. Um, and also the, if we can even do our other plans, um, include those as well. Um, if we're just talking about the spreadsheet for a second, can yes. I have one? One more thing is um, just looking at the district um, on the spreadsheet. Um, 
I'm not sure how useful that is. It seems to be slightly inconsistent because sometimes um, it's like citywide and sometimes it's a particular district, but sometimes it's something that says it's a particular district, but it's really citywide. And so I just think we need to give another thought of like what we're trying to accomplish by having that there. Um, I think like if it's a particular park renovation for one, you know, but although Burgess Park is kind of a citywide park. So I'm not sure what that's giving us. Um, but I understand why it's there, but I don't know. It's just something to think about. Is if it's helpful for staff, I'm okay with it. If it's not necessary, yeah. Yes. But I agree. It could uh, review and um, more consistency would be beneficial. And also, um, District One and District Three end up coming up quite a bit because that's where the city facilities are, and yet those are citywide. Um, benefits. So it's, I think, taking another look and see what the district, what purpose it fills. And then if, if it does fill a purpose, then um, probably on citywide facilities rather than ha to have it all rather than um, district one or district three. Great. We, we will uh, reassess based on the function and services. Thank you, Ms. Gaia and Ms. Mitch, for your presentation and for all of the information you have provided the city council and the public. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is regular business. Item E, under regular business, the city council considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require city council approval. Our first item is E1, introduce and waive the first reading amending our municipal code section 2.04.160, salaries established to modify city council member compensation, continued from our May 7th meeting. Here to introduce this item is our city clerk, Judy Heron. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. So yes, the item before the city council is the first reading and introduction of an ordinance related to city council compensation. Uh, staff does have one update to the ordinance since the publishing of the agenda. Staff is requesting that the proposed ordinance be updated to clarify the amended and unchanged sections of chapter 2.04 as displayed on the screen. We are proposing amending sections 2.04.160, 100, and 120 and the remainder of the sections in chapter 2.04 would be unchanged. Uh, these changes will be brought before the city council at the next reading of this item. Next, I just wanted to provide a little bit of detail and maybe some clarification on the process. Uh, the proposed ordinance would modify the city council's current compensation. The city council did receive an informational item on March 12th in preparation for this item. Because this is an ordinance, there is a two-step process. The first being a first reading and an introduction, which you are hearing tonight. And this can be done at a regular or a special city council meeting. The second step is the second reading and adoption, which must be heard at a regular city council meeting. I would also like to note that any change in city council compensation would be applicable to the seated members of the city council after the November 2024 election. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Happy to answer any clarifying questions or open it up to public comment. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Are there any clarifying questions from city council members? Ms. Heron, can you please take public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on regular business item E1, introduce and waive the first reading, amending municipal code section 2.04.160 salaries established to modify city council compensation. If you are participating virtually, please engage that hand feature bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, complete a speaker card at the back table, return to me at the clerk's desk. And this will be the final call for public comment on regular business item E1. 
Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Taylor, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Bringing it back to the dais, are there questions or comments from staff, um, from city council members? Council member Dorr. Yes, thank you. I am glad to see this as council stipends are an important way to help cover costs for those who are serving in this role, whether that be cost for babysitters or transportation or the material cost of printing out extra flyers and handing things out, um, the, the cost of serving the community in this way on council. Um, and of course, I wanna acknowledge that stipends, even with the, with the upgrade, of course, is not enough to replace lost income. So it's it doesn't mean that um, it, it's the only way to help make councils uh, a more diverse and representative of communities, but I think it is an important factor to, to help ensure there is uh, recognition and some help to cover costs of, of serving. Um, but of course, that there, there are a lot of other ways to help increase representative uh, leadership and diverse leadership on councils, which is one of the reasons why I was excited about seeing this. Um, and so just want to acknowledge that this is not the only way to, to help increase diversity and representativeness on our councils, and that there are a lot of other things that also can be done to help folks from different backgrounds and experiences serve in this role. Um, I personally am so grateful that I, I have a very flexible job that allows me to, to take time out of my day to have meetings while also serving. Um, and so, but I'd like it to be more accessible for folks that have hourly paid, uh, really strict strict rules on, on when they can spend time would, would like it to be accessible for other folks too. I'll stop there. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Councilmember Willison. Thank you. I think I agreed with everything that Councilmember Dorr said. Um, I typed in something to Google about inflation. I think I said like $150 in 1965 what would it be in today's dollars? And I think it was like $1,487. I don't think any of us do this job to get rich. Um, and so I think this is just something that is uh, long overdue. Um, you know, I've already announced I'm not running again, so I won't be a, a beneficiary of this. I think this is just uh, trying to make this uh, better for those who uh, follow us. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Willison. And if there are no other city council member comments, I'll entertain a motion. I so move. I'll second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by city council member Doerr and a second by city council member Willison to introduce and waive the first reading amending municipal code section 2.04.160 salaries established to modify city council compensation and amending sections 2.04.00 and 2.04.120 to replace mayor pro tempore with vice mayor. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none, we will be doing roll call vote with uh, one council member absent. Uh, so our first one is uh, city council member Nash. Yes. City council member Willison. Yes. City council member Dower. Yes. Mayor Taylor. Yes. And the motion passes with vice mayor Combs absent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Heron. And at this time we will take a seven minute break.
All right. Having our city council back at our in-person dais. Mayor Taylor, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Our next item is our study session, item F. Study sessions are an opportunity for city council for city staff to introduce an item that will require policy direction from the city council in the near future. City staff will provide a presentation. I will then call for public comment. After public comment, the city council will discuss the matter interactively with staff. The city council will not take action on items addressed in study sessions. The city council may provide direction to city staff for preparation for additional analysis or information necessary when the item returns to the city council for action. The study session item is provide direction on updating the city council procedure manual continued from our May 7th city council meeting. Here to introduce this item is our city clerk, Judy Heron. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. So yes, the item before you uh, currently is to provide direction on the city council's procedures manual. This study session is an opportunity for the city council to provide direction on the proposed edits made to the city council manual. Specifically, staff is seeking input and edits made to the following sections, placing an item on the agenda, public comment, voting procedures, city manager and city council member reports, proclamations and certificates of recognition, and updates and removals of various chapters and sections of the manual. The staff report provides greater detail on the background of the city council's procedures manual. It was created in 2006 and amended throughout 2007 through 2018. In 2019, the city council established an ad hoc subcommittee to work with staff and review current city council procedures and recommend updates. In March of 2020, the city council disbanded that ad hoc subcommittee. From 2020 to 2021, staff returned to the city council with new and updated individual procedures. Staff is now recommending repealing individual policies and procedures that are related to governance and incorporating revised content into a manual. First, staff is seeking city council input and consensus around proposed updates on placing an item on the agenda, which is attachment S to the staff report. These updates include addressing discrepancies between the current 2018 procedures manual and the individual adopted procedures. It also incorporates city council direction that was received from goal setting. Secondly, uh, staff is seeking input and consensus around proposed public comment, which is page eight of attachment Z in the staff report. These updates include the inclusion of virtual public comment and removes the requirement of speakers providing their name and residence, removal of reference to time donation, as this can be done by the mayor's discretion, and visual requests requiring coordination with the city clerk before a city council meeting for videos, PowerPoint presentations, or similar displays. Third, we are seeking consensus and input around the proposed updates to the voting procedures. This is attachment T to the staff report. These updates include roll call voting when one or more city council member is participating remotely, which is required per Robert's rules of order. And staff is suggesting that the city council annually determine the order of that roll call vote. There's additional language around a tie vote during an appeal and the reconsideration language was updated to simplify the more lengthy Robert's Rules of Order process. Here we are seeking input and consensus around city manager and city council member reports, which is attachment U to the staff report. These updates include creating one agenda item for both city manager and city council member reports. Removing language around placing an item on the agenda, which currently contradicts the current manual as well as the proposed procedure. And also incorporating direction from the goal setting about a city council member report out form. Five, staff is seeking input and consensus around the proposed updates to proclamations and certificates of recognition, attachment B to the staff report. 
These updates include adding certificates of recognition to this section, defined request guidelines, and define issuance of proclamations and certificates. Lastly, staff is seeking input and consensus around the updates and removal of various sections of the manual, which are attachments W through AA in the staff report. These updates include removal of portions governed by state law and the municipal code, Remove and update portions that are historical overview, are not a procedure or a policy, and or recommend to be added to new documents, such as city manager policies or a city council member orientation document. There are also minor updates that do not significantly alter the substance or meaning of the content, as an example, updating the term mayor pro tempore to vice mayor, fixing any typos and updating terminology. Lastly, add sections related to appointments, subcommittees, remote appearance, annual recess, and required trainings. That concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any clarifying questions or open it up to public comment. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Are there any clarifying questions from the city council before we go to public comment? Council Member Willison. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, I just was looking at the form uh, for the report outs and just had a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, so is the way you're envisioning it that a council member would complete this form um, and then would that information be published somewhere or would the city council member be verbally giving that um, during the meeting like we kind of do now? And then my second question is, um, sometimes a city council member might want to report something or bring something up about their office hours or, or something that doesn't fall under an agency. Um, would that use this form as well? Or how do you envision that? Thanks. Thank you, council member Wilson. So for the second question, uh, yes, I think that even if it is an update of office hours or, um, attending a non-agency event that the form could still be used. Um, it would be ideal for myself, the city clerk, to receive the form ahead of time so that way it can be published in the agenda. Um, so that way the city council member can then choose whether they want to verbalize the report out as well as having it attached or just having the attachment. Um, it's not a requirement to complete the form at this time to provide a report out, but it would be encouraged. Thank you, said so that would be listed um, under the agenda. Would there be a staff report showing all the council members report outs or? It would probably just be the attachment. It would just be the form okay. and it would come under the city council member report item. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, council member Willison. And if there are no more questions at this moment, we will go ahead and take public comment. Ms. Heron, can you take public comment at this time? Yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item F1, provide direction on updating the city council procedure manual, participating virtually, please engage that hand feature bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, you can complete a speaker card at that back table, return to me at the clerk's desk. And this will be the final call for public comment on item F1. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Taylor, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron. And we'll bring it back to the dais and hear public, hear council member discussion. Um, would you like um, us to go um, item by item or give all of our feedback on all of the items. Honestly, I think give all of the feedback on all the items. Okay. Or, or you don't, you want item. Okay. We'll do item by item. Okay. Then I can give, um, feedback on placing an item on the agenda. Is that the first one? Yes. Okay. So, um, I've for some reason thought about this a lot <laughs> and, um, I think this needs to be simplified. 
Um, I think at the end of the day, the main question is whether or not the council wants to bring this item uh, for a discussion. And if so, what level of staff involvement there needs to be um, ahead of it coming to council. So sometimes, um, I can't remember what was the item that we discussed recently without a staff report. We, we recently... Any manager Murphy, do you remember what that item was? Uh, th through the mayor, yes. So I um, I, I maybe there I'm, was I'm recalling one item that still had a staff report, but it was a, a minimal staff report um, regarding community events. It kind of attached some previous staff reports and just provide a little bit of framework, but didn't have any additional analysis. So um, sometimes the council just wants to discuss something, and so um, I would say. That, I think it's the way it's written now, a lot of those options are kind of the same, but slightly different. But I think the real question as a decision maker trying to decide whether or not I want to like veer, be part of veering the city towards a new topic is, is this something we're just discussing once? Um, or is this something that the city, that like on, on our own? Or is this something that we are asking staff to to do a bunch of research and that could bump a bunch of stuff other than city council management, uh, the meetings? Um, so for me, it's almost like, do we want to devote any council time to this? And then if so, um, how much staff time ahead of it do we want there to be? So it could be like low, medium, high, so in the example of, of the meeting, I guess, that we had on um, community events, I'd be like, okay, someone says they want to discuss community events. Um, let's um, get to it when, if there's a majority that wants to, to touch it, then um, is this something that's going to involve just a conversation among ourselves? Is it something that's going to involve a lot of research and shifting of priorities for staff? And then that will help me inform whether or not I would support it coming back. I just, the way it's written now, I I find it, I find it confusing. And maybe I'm not being clear. I'm trying to simplify it, but maybe I'm not simplifying it. Um, anyway, I just think that there's gotta be a better way of doing this. And I'm maybe I'm not sure what that is. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I'm happy to try that a first response. Um, I think where we may run into a little bit of an issue is having the city council discuss an item that's not on an agenda, even in the broadest of terms, whether it's a low, high, or medium priority. Um, the way the proposed uh, procedure is, it allows staff to agendize an item with a staff report that is very minimal on staff's time, and then allows the city council to at least have that discussion. So maybe the outcome of that isn't, you know, direct the city manager, direct the item. Maybe those steps are altered. But I think um, actually getting the item agendized is very important, even to have that very high level discussion. That's an excellent point. So maybe it's um, it's still those four choices right now to me are very confusing. So maybe it's just like a yes, no of whether you even want this to come back. And then when it comes back, then then it's just a low, medium, high. You're making, I can't read you. Council <laughs> Member Nash. So I guess I am um, would like clarification on, my understanding was this was to how to place it on the agenda. And I actually liked the approach that staff had where there'd actually would just be a form. And- No, I like the form. Okay, so you're talking about the next step once so, it comes so, back to council. So I guess, so So it goes on a form, the, the person wanting the item. So let's say I want to um, have ice cream giveaway every Tuesday in the city or something. So I, I want to agendize that idea. Um, so I fill out the form and then it comes to council and then the council can decide there needs to be three votes to say this is an idea worth pursuing and even talking about. And so I don't get the support for that because people feel like we don't have the resources or the time or it's just not a priority. Or I get the support for it, then it comes back. Um, so it gets on an agenda. And then um, and then the question is, do we want to, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm I'm I guess is the 
So the four options here are for the second stage. Okay, they're for, maybe I'm getting myself confused. I guess I'm still confused about these seconds, like referring it, because one's like tackle it right away, tackle it whenever you, you can get to it, tackle it at goal setting, which I feel like isn't really a thing because we have basically established that goal setting isn't for kind of one-off projects. Or the fourth is uh, refer it to a commission, which seems weird too. Th these just seem like weird um, directions to go. And I, I don't have an exact answer, but th it seems like overly complicated is what I'm getting at. And I guess I'm just, I'm trying to have a discussion with you guys on how we can streamline this and make this less confusing. Because honestly, I find this very confusing. I was looking at this as how to get it on the agenda meeting. Initially, someone has an idea they want to agendize and they fill out a form. I would think that they'd send it to the city manager and perhaps to the city clerk and to the mayor. It gets emailed and then it goes onto an agenda for council discussion. And then once it's on a, an agenda and it's in front of the council, that's when you're talking about it. But I don't think it goes on the agenda until there's at least three people that want to talk about it. I was seeing this as it goes on. Maybe we need a clarification. I was seeing this as it goes on to the agenda under council member requests. Correct. Yeah, without a vote or consensus, the form could be submitted. Um, it would go under city council initiated items for that city council discussion. And if there's votes, then we to... can actually have a discussion exactly. about how many resources. Correct. So Mayor right. Taylor, if I could just jump in. Yes, please. So just to clarify the, the way that the language is drafted now, the form, the request form would automatically appear under the count, city council initiated items. So it would automatically go on an agenda and that agenda item is is sort of narrow. It, it would be, does the council want to do something more with the, this request as a future agenda item? And so those different options are the options that the council has in terms of directing a few, you know, future action on the item itself. Of course, council can um, edit this proposed language from staff to make it more streamlined. But I think the idea is to give the council a clear understanding of all of the steps that can be taken after the item has been um, presented as a potential future agenda item. I, I understand this part for placing an item on the agenda, but I, I hear the, the concern about, okay, it's on an agenda, we're discussing it. Where is the, the manual section that says, the next step of these four options is that repeated somewhere in this uh, manual and are these the right four things to say and I, I myself when I tried to put the agenda item on was it bringing back ALPRs or one of the other conversations um, it was confusing because we were saying yes share res share something back a very informal staff report uh, but but trying to I, I hear what council member Wollison is saying about how much work are we asking? And if there was a way to to make it clearer how soon we want it back? Yeah, I, I think two things. One is the staff effort involved and two is the timing. So like if, if, if someone fills out a form and they get their item to go under city council initiated items and then the council then says, yay or nay, we're gonna, we want to do something. Let's say we want to go forward with this. Then I think the real question is, well, how much staff effort do they want to go into this, like leading up to the real discussion about it? And when do they want to have this discussion? Because I think that's what this, these four options are getting at, but I just don't think these four paths are the cleanest way of moving that forward. Unfortunately, I don't have the solution. I just know what the confusion is. The city Clerk Heron, do you have a suggestion? So looking at the four proposed actions for a city council initiated item, staff could return with maybe something more along the lines what has been discussed up at the dais today, um, but I don't have uh, any quick solutions at the moment. 
what one suggestion I would make Mayor Taylor, if I may, is I mean that it can be as simple as you know after a discussion with a motion a second the city council uh, may take action and in, in providing direction to staff. So I mean it can be whatever the council wants to direct staff to do at that moment. So and action could include or direction could include you know uh, time requirements for preparation of the staff report. Um, you know, recommendations on submission to an advisory body uh, or deferring the action to the city council's annual uh, goal setting process. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stolte. So the first and third bullets are trying to get at timeline and staff resources as well. So I think if we added, especially with the first bullet, that is a more immediate action. So we might be able to add um, a little more text there around kind of the low, medium, high expectations of what goes into um, preparing a follow-up item. Um, the third bullet is really, you know, as resources are available, so it's pushing it out. <laughs> it's more of a discussion between the council and the city manager of where that would fit in with our overall priorities and agenda management. But maybe we could work in some extra language on um, staff effort. Council Member Willison. So um, Assistant City Attorney Bazzano, is it? Oh, hi, thank you. Um, so it's on a city council initiated agenda. So it's under city council initiated items. Then at that time, is the city council allowed to talk? Is that when the city council would have it under the scenario that you have? Because I'm starting to kind of like it because each item is kind of unique in and of itself. And we kind of need, need information about how much the staff thinks that it would take and then how it ranks up vis-a-vis -vis the other priorities, like what gets bumped, which is different depending on which department it might fall under. So are we allowed to have that type of unique conversation around the time requirements, whether it goes to an advisory body, whether it's, um, going to have a, a robust staff report and re have this kind of an interaction with the city manager and, and potentially a department head. Does that, is that discussion from allowable under just that form being submitted? Yes. So you could have that initial discussion of asking these preliminary questions about timing, staffing needs, et cetera. Um, at a very high level, you wouldn't be able to go into the details and discuss the underlying topic itself, but you would be able to talk about, well, I mean, if we if we do this, how much time do we want staff to dedicate to preparing, you know, uh, the staff report, analyzing the issue, conducting the preliminary review, et cetera. That could definitely occur. But ultimately, this is sort of like, I mean, the way to view it is a, is a two-step process. The first step is this uh, request form and this initial discussion on whether or not you're going to agendize it. And then the second step is actually having that agenda discussion. Is Can we attach a time limit on the discussion after, we, after the uh, request form is submitted? At that initial discussion by the council? Yes. Uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, I mean, you could, yes, this is a policy decision. The council can make that decision, certainly. Um, it, it's, it, um, you could also include the, the council member making the request could also include in their request form what they envision the steps might be that staff needs to take. You know, in some jurisdictions where they use uh, this two step process. A council member will say in his request form, you know, I want a very minimal staff report. I only want, you know, this item to be a very cursory discussion about X, Y, Z, so that when the council considers that form, they know, okay, this council member really just wants to talk about a basic issue. He doesn't want a lot of staff time dedicated to it, so I can support that. Um, Ms. Oh, may I? Okay. Ms. Pisano, um, so uh, you, you mentioned other cities. 
have you seen um, something that's like a potentially we could consider a best practice in this area? Well, um, I in San Mateo County, Foster City, I know uses this sim a similar process to this to, that that's being proposed. Um, of these so, four bullets here, or of having just like a, a high level discussion with just, staff, just or, having a high level. Uh, so they they don't really have these bullet points, um, as I recall offhand. I don't believe they have these bullet points. They just have you know the discussion part. And then, of course, they can provide direction to staff depending on what the council, what a majority of the council wants to do with that um, that suggested item. Councilmember Dorr, maybe it would be helpful then in in the language here and in the other section where it talks about the discussion that follows after you place it on the on the agenda, um, the broader language that our assistant city city attorney proposed, and then. Uh, for example, and then these full bu four bullets, would that better represent the the direction that you're potentially proposing here of have it open, but then have a direction that folks could go when they are trying to propose an action? I was liking the more like examples being considerations, like the time, staff effort, like the the urgency, the staff effort, the the whether it's going to an advisory body, whatnot, then these four, four bullets have always been confusing to me. Sorry. I, but I'm curious what my colleagues have to say. I'm also curious what the city manager's office has to say. I, I'm actually supportive of using time and staffing as the criteria for determining adding something to the agenda for a city, a city council member request. I, I support having the form and then the two-step process that of the assistant city attorney um, referenced. And I don't know, council member Nash, and I didn't know if the city manager or assistant city manager had a comment. Uh, yes, I, I, I do at the appropriate time. I do see uh, council member Nash that seems uh, interested in speaking though. So I don't see the difference between what we're discussing and what we currently have, other than how you request it to actually get on the agenda for this discussion. And I actually would say that I think that what we've been doing works fine. Um, and that we have, it, it feels to me like we have had a lot of discussion around the topics and come up with one of these four items or some variation that staff has provided the input as far as balancing resources and how much effort. And so I am would love more information about why we should change it. Um, so I just find these four items just, um, they're confusing to me. I don't know how better, better to articulate it. Um, I, I, for me, what the determining factors of whether I'm going to support an item is, is might not even be the time that staff puts in or the, the resources, but like whether it's in line with our priorities, if it's going to derail us. So there's a lot of other calculations, but to help make that decision, like if it's a little thing, um, I, I don't mean to make a thing of this, and I know we're spending a lot of time on this. So if, if the rest of the council wants to stick with this, I'm fine with it. I just personally find this a little confusing. I, I love the idea of the form. I love the idea of that uh, streamlining how it's going to get on the agenda. I just find these four pathways. Um, I don't know if it's that they're not mutually exclusive. There's just something about them that have always... But don't you think we've gotten there with the discussion? But I don't think that aligns then <laughs> with what these four bullets... If, if we're having a discussion, then them. But again, this is, um, I'm, I defer to, if, if you feel like we've already flushed this out, then I'm happy to leave it. So just want to follow up with the city manager. Uh, yes, thank you. So I, I would, I would say that based off tonight's discussion, there is the opportunity to do some refinements, uh, to this that I think distills a lot of what, uh, we're hearing, um, this evening. So I, I, I do think it would be, um, uh, productive, constructive to kind of um, 
distilled the essence of those four items into considerations. The, the way that's written right now, it makes it seem like you can only choose one of those four things. So I think we can kind of uh, strike that balance. I think uh, uh, it, it's clear it's a two-step process. There's going to be a form. So I think the main thing that would be helpful for me to hear this evening from the council is whether or not you would like the form to include some of those questions and considerations for a council member to complete. And frankly, it vary by council member. Some council members may want to answer the four additional questions. Some council members may not, but at least I think having whatever those considerations are in the form would be helpful. So I think, uh, again, this is a study session. This needs to um, come back to the council. I think there's the draft form that was shown in the presentation. We can flesh out that that form some more to include those additional considerations. We can provide the sample staff reports of what have been done most recently. I, I do think there's the ability um, to refine this a little bit. So thank you, City Manager Murphy. Council uh, Member City Wilson. Manager Murphy, I believe that the form was for the um the city council member report out, not for the yes, uh, sorry, I, I apologize, but the same concept of the form, okay, like that. I, I think there yeah, could yeah. be a, an area on the form that said something like to the filler out to the council member filling this out, like what do you what information can you provide about what how you envision it or however that was saying? And a thoughts might include amount of staff time, when you feel like this needs to be taken up, things like that. But I'd love the idea of you guys thinking more. Council Member Door. I'm supportive of the form. I think this is helpful. I will say as the, the newest council member, I was really confused earlier this year when I was trying to put something on the agenda for the first time about these options. So appreciate the option of spending a little bit more time to clarify these are some of the options and clarifying also the the description uh, of, of some of these number one is highest priority and takes the most amount of time and kind of explaining that out here. Um, just so maybe the newer people who are sitting on these on the dais can uh, have that context as well. Thank you. Council Member Nash. So it it is permissible for whoever's making the request to, um, to put this on on the agenda could attach a letter to the form or provide the information because I think the more context can be provided to the council ahead of time um, will make for a better discussion. Which is what the form would do because there'd be spots in the form where you could fill that out and provide that context, I believe. And, and the form would have to be submitted by Wednesday before the council meeting or not the day before or the day of? Correct, it needs to be submitted before with enough time to uh, attach it to the agenda. Yeah, two business days before the publication of the agenda, okay. which is uh, would be Tuesday because we published Thursday. Okay, thank you. Council Member Wilson. Yeah, I would just ask that the an example is put in there because two business days always confuses me. Uh, two business days before the publication. So like put it in there, at, for example, if a council meeting is on a Tuesday, the publication is on a Thursday, therefore two days before is the Tuesday before, or something like that. So a new council member can look at, it, or a member of the public can know. Yeah, it, it'll be a part of the new council member orientation. All right, that was the first item. Now, item number two. If I could pause the city council just one moment, I just want to make sure that I've received all of uh, the feedback we are looking to proceed with a form, um, adding to that form what the city council member kind of wants to see from this item. Um, perhaps the ability to add an attachment to the form. W was there discussion around uh, adding to the form um, if this is a city council current goal or priority? That's okay. A good idea. I am seeing nods. All yes. right. Um, and then kind of returning to these four bullets. Um, what I gathered from the discussion is maybe adding time impacts um, or staff efforts, the, the uh, even the level of urgency maybe to the bullets, just kind of cleaning those up based on uh, just some of the discussion that was up on the dais, but keeping them, uh, keeping the four. Yes. Okay. My understanding was staff was going to take another look at it yeah. and provide a new recommendation, an updated recommendation. At the four bullets, correct? Yes. yes.
I'm seeing three nods. <laughs> okay. All right. And so with that, was there any further direction on placing an item on the agenda? Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, if the city council would like to move on to attachment T, which is voting procedures, we can do that. Yes, please. Thank you. Public comment is the next item, I believe. Thank you. Let me bring that item up. So that would be attachment Z, page eight. Thank you for your patience. It's coming up. Okay, and as mentioned, um, the proposed changes is um, the inclusion of virtual public comment, removing uh, the requirement of speakers providing their name and residence, removal of time donation, and uh, requiring coordination uh, with the city clerk for visual requests. And I'll go ahead and turn that back to the dais. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Is there any discussion on this item? Or are we comfortable with the staff's recommendations? I'm curious about the, the helpful flexibility of if there are many, many people reducing down to two minutes. Um, and so that, that's a curiosity I have for, for others in the dais, if there's a desire or a value in keeping something that creates that optionality. Council member Willison. Um, I think that, so I've been both a member of the public for many years and a council member. So I have multiple perspectives on how long it feels to, to make public comment and what those public comments, how they land. I think that um, one of the most important things with public comment is certainty of of knowing how long you have um and so i think it, it it is challenging i think we've been playing around with this you know depending on how many speakers there are thing i i'm going to throw something out there it would be like a two minute standard public comment but allow up to the three um donating time because i don't think donating time happens that often um, so if people feel strongly enough, like to dedicate six minutes to that, to me is fine. But, um, I hear what people are saying that they want to share a lot. People can always email in to CCIN city.council at menlopark.gov ahead of time. They can reach us, um, lots of different ways. Um, but I, I think that the council does have a lot of, um, important business to discuss. And usually, um, I think two minutes can be sufficient. So that's what I would propose. And would the maximum time donated would be up to six minutes? I'm I'm supportive. Is this for just general public comment or any public comment? And I would think it would be any for public any public comment. comment. Yes. Council Member Dolan. I'm also wondering for folks who maybe don't have public speaking experience, if two minutes will feel intimidating and rushed for folks. Um, not to complicate it, but I do want to just raise that, that that's a concern I have about moving to two minutes. But I hear, I completely agree with the importance of also having certainty and knowing how much time you have in advance as you're preparing your comments. Um, I, I think because this is the one, there's the public comment at the beginning and the public comment throughout. Um, I would be a little bit more inclined to three minutes 
per person um, to ensure that folks, you know, who are not able to be as succinct can still have enough space to get out their ideas. Um, but another alternative is is also we say two minutes and then we, the city clerk allows up to three, depending on if they can't make their comment as we already do, as the city clerk already does. So I'm curious for other thoughts. Is there any thought about having, if we left it at three minutes, um, but had a, a open public comment period in the beginning of the meeting and potentially in the middle of the meeting. So public comment would be say six to 6.30. So having an established time. I'm just thinking about this is something that we've all been actually helping and that is getting our meetings completed by 10.30 as opposed to I've sat in this dais until 1.30 in the morning before. So I wanna see the public have access to public comment, but I also wanna see a discussion with the council and regular business for the city to move forward. So how do you do that um, with a five and a half hour meeting? So that's what I'm thinking about, which is why for city council member requests, it is put a time limit on it. So just start putting time limits on things and doing it um, with, through a lens of fairness. So that's what I'm interested in. So is that two minutes or three minutes? Just clarifying your proposal of the half hour of public comment time. So would that mean to certain folks that if there's like 20 public comments, let's say it's two minutes, does that mean um, only, why can't I do the math? 15 people, <laughs> only 15 of the 20 people make their public comment in that first half hour and then the other um, five make it later or they or or all of them are heard or how are you envisioning that in a situation like that all would be heard under the two minutes because it's only extending it by 10 minutes just trying to figure out a way how to be fair and not have an eight-hour council meeting and i don't have the perfect answer to it i just figure we have flexibility based on how many people show up to our council meetings, whether they're in person or on Zoom. So, Council Member Nash, do you have any thoughts? So I like two minutes, um, just having a consistent two minutes for public comment for the same reasons um, Council Member Willison articulated. Um, I would like to, I, I Mr. Blowey raised the idea of having a um, public comment in the beginning and public comment on the end. I actually think I, I could support that idea. I think that that's a good idea or what you were talking about where there's one in the middle um, perhaps. Um, but I don't know that I'd like to see a time limit on them. Um, I certainly understand it and perhaps if um, I, I guess I would I would just be concerned that that might inhibit public discussion if there is that much discussion about an item. So, so having two public comment periods at two minutes each. And speakers could have two would have two minutes. Um, I would support the three um, uh, extensions that three donations. Thank you. Um, and having two public comment times, although I'd certainly want to hear from staff how what they have. It sounds like that was a um, practice previously. Um, but I guess I would say that people could only speak once. Um, so that if you spoke in the beginning, you cannot. Um, you would not be. You could speak at any of the for on any of the topics, but you could only speak in general public comment once. And that yeah. would be governed by the Brown Act because general public comment is one agenda item, even if it is split, it would just be reopened if we did it a second time. It's my understanding, uh, City Manager, was there previously a second comment period? And if so, why was it removed? Uh, let's see, so through the mayor. 
Yes, there was there, there was indeed two separate uh, public comment periods. It, the reason why it was removed, I, I don't recall. So I'd have to research that. I'd be curious if there might be a reason for that of maybe if the meetings are going till 1030 and then they're being open for public comment, folks might not be coming. Um, and so was it just a, a holdover that no, no, no one was actually using? So why was it kept? I, I'm curious to know what that reasoning might be. And I'd want to know that reasoning before supporting a second comment period. I think it's very helpful that there's one very known time at the beginning of the meeting where, t where comments are taken. On the idea of, of holding time, it makes me wonder of, do any other cities have a, okay, public comment will be a max an hour at the beginning of a meeting. And if it goes beyond that, it'll continue at the next meeting or it can continue on at a later, later time during that same meeting. Um, because I, I know that here in the table, it shows cities or in the agenda, it shows um, cities that have different time limits, but not about how how long public comment period on the whole goes. And then, and also some cities do not allow for donated time. Council Member Willison. City Attorney, Assistant City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Sorry, I, did, I just wanted to chime in because I do, uh, I am aware of a few cities that do for controversial items or items where they know there are going to be significant public comments, they will, the mayor uh, as the chair of the meeting will set a, a maximum time limitation on public comments. Like we will receive 30 minutes of public comments. Every speaker gets one minute each. And then at the end of the 30 minutes, the public comment period shall be over. Um, but usually it is, most cities typically use a three minute general public comment period. And then they'll of course reserve in their policies, the chair or the council's discretion to adjust that time limit either by, by speaker and or a maximum time limit on public comments for those um, meetings where there are going to be a lot of speakers um, and you need that flexibility to get through the meeting and to finish your, your business. Really appreciate that flexibility. Thank you for sharing that experience. I, I, I would love to see that kind of language reflected here of uh, flexibility that the mayor has. Um, okay, and to limit, okay, it says here, therefore the other presiding to hold audience and impose time limits per speaker. Okay, it's saying that, but I wonder if we could also say time limits per speaker and an overall time limit on, on how long the comment period goes, if that's another avenue that would be helpful for the city, for the for the mayor to, to possibly help make sure there's time for public comment, but also time for business. Thank you. And, and just as a reminder, we still have, this is general public comment we're talking about. We still have public comment on each item that's on the agenda. So I don't, are we doing both together? Ms. Heron, are we doing both yeah, together? This is related to public comment across the board for general public comment, as well as items on the agenda, aside from maybe the discussion about a certain time uh, restriction on general public comment. Okay. Which would be, you know, say 30 minutes, you know, at the start of the meeting, 30 minutes mid meeting for general public comment. But what I'm saying is more of what the assistant city attorney is saying is that mm -hmm. if there is a controversial item on the agenda, mm -hmm. even saying, okay, we see everyone who wants to comment, we'll give 30 minutes or 50 minutes. Just to open to that next. discretion. Understood. Yes. Council member Nash. If we were to, I, I guess I am interested in sticking to two minutes. Um, I think that having a consistent time is very beneficial for the speakers to be able to plan um, rather than have their speaking time reduced, which is very hard to, to scramble um, when you're in the audience and all of a sudden you're trying to repackage your comments. Um, so I, I feel I would like to keep the um, two minutes. I am concerned about having a time limit 
um, although I understand. So perhaps we could, if we have a controversial item, we could actually say in the agenda that we will hold one hour or 30 minutes or whatever of public comment and actually just pre-announce it. Um, and therefore, well. Council Member Wilberson. Thanks, Mayor Taylor. I think I'm uh, very much in alignment with Council Member Nash on this. Um, I would, I, I think, um, you know, it's kind of like that work-life balance. It's a, it's a fantasy. <laughs> like, how are we going to balance making sure everyone gets to express themselves as much as they want and our desire and need to wrap up our meetings while our brains are still functioning uh, at a high level? You know, we're never going to strike that perfect balance. And so I think what we're trying to do here is, is an impossible task. So I, again, I think based on the experience I've had in these chambers many years, I think it's appropriate to have two minutes of general public comment. I like Council Member Nash's idea of pre-announcing for items where we think we're going to have a lot of people or something at the top that says items that draw like large crowds, you know, maybe limited uh, to a certain speaking time or whatever. Um, and then I think the one time for public comment is, is sufficient. Uh, remember, this is general public comment. Um, and folks have other avenues to express their their opinions. Um, and then making someone stick around to the very end of the meeting. And again, the mayor has discretion to reopen public comment at any time. So as long as we have these safeguards of mayor mayoral discretion, I think we're fine. But setting a standard that it's going to be two minutes, there's it's going to be at the beginning of the meeting, and that when huge crowds come, you know, there may be a uh, uh, limiting, but but that should be few and far between uh, times. And perhaps um, it, we typically know which item agenda items will attract the big crowd. So perhaps we can even, as part of the agenda item, say that in this um, case there will be some. You know, if we are going to, if we want to impose a time limit, I would suggest it's actually published with the agenda item. So sometimes we know and sometimes we don't know. So like, for example, I believe we're having a study session on the Parkline project next week, um, which is um, the SRI redevelopment. I know there's been a lot of chatter on Nextdoor about it and a lot of interested parties. I have no idea how many people are going to come to council chambers. It could uh, to talk or to, to dial in. It could be five people. It could be 30 people. So I think it's sometimes impossible to tell. So I'm, I'm again, I don't know if we're ever going to find the perfect process for this. Um, but as long as there's that discretion that the mayor has and that it's up front, you know, that we do our best. These are all, you know, policy decisions, so we can change our mind kind of at any time. But, um, yeah, I think we're trying to give the public advance notice of what's going on. I'm aligned with everything that Councilmember Wollaston shared, except the two minutes. I, I still am thinking that three minutes would be helpful for folks, um, depending on their their, you know, so to give them the space to share if they need more time. City Clerk Karen, what are your thoughts? Two minutes or three minutes? <laughs> I mean, you're the receiver of public comment. You listen to it. Um, I will only point out on page four of the staff report on that um, public comment poll, it does list the cities who have three minutes, who have two minutes, and then the one city that is based on the number of speakers. So for the, like the city of San Mateo, which is based on number of speakers, if there's 10 or more speakers, I believe it goes down to two minutes. If there's um, over 10 speakers, it goes down to one minute per speaker. And I believe they start off uh, at three minutes. But and then I can show it on the screen. And, and that's similar to what we do now. That is similar to um, an, a, a process that we have been using when we have uh, 10 or more speakers, yes. Through the mayor, you make you make a good point about that's what we do now. We don't proactively advertise that though. It's mm -hmm. at the beginning of each meeting. So that may be something that's considered as if, if you <clears throat> did want to continue that, that we're, we're at least like advertising that to people ahead of time because for, new people that come there, that's maybe a little bit, bit of a surprise for them. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Nash. And I would actually recommend that if we know, like for Parkline, maybe we actually 
start for this next week saying there will be a two minute time limit for this item, for this one item and see how it goes. So since this is a, a study session session and Vice Mayor Combs is not here, I'm I'm interested in keeping some flexibility. And so since we know that Park Line, I agree with Councilmember Nash, we know that we are likely to have quite a few speakers. Um, let's try it for our next meeting where it is a two minute limit for that one time. For the for the one item. Yeah, that's something we can add to like the public notice section of the staff report as well as the agenda title on the agenda. So then we can do it for everything. Does that work? Are we running a test next time on this? Or what's the, what's our goal? I guess at some point we have to give the, the staff direction on what we want to do with this procedure manual. So are we going to have them see what happens next week with two minutes on every item and then and then have it come back and then give them direction. I'm just trying to decide what sense. Yes. So it'll be two minutes for each item next week. And this is a pilot to see how well it works. Um, we did get a few public comments on in our email. One was requesting that we keep it at three minutes. And based on our last meeting, where we had it at two minutes, I I think it went well, but it might change um, depending on the topic. So if we keep it at three minutes, what about time donation? I mean, I would say if we keep it at three minutes, then no time donation. Someone can always have, you know, pass their card to this person and have them stand up. But um, well, it sounds like this is coming back to us anyway. It's coming back. And so. actually, six minutes is maybe we have one. I mean, you're allowed to do uh, one other time donation. So you have a total of six minutes. But it's coming back, yes. I'm just curious, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, how you mentioned in one of the comments you said earlier that I heard you say three minutes and the, the table that we have is just showing cities in San Mateo County. Do you work with cities in other counties? And if so, is there a standard you see for one amount of time? It's, it's typically three minutes <laughs> in most of the other counties that I work in and most, uh, I think all the jurisdictions I've ever worked in, it's three minutes, um, is the typical time frame, unless, like I said, there's some controversial item or there's a lot of public speakers um, that are going to provide comments, so the the chair will reduce the time for that particular item. Thank you. Or I think that better public comment. Understood. And, and if I could just add one more thing about the donation of time, um, I understand that it can be helpful to speakers, but I also think that there's nothing that prohibits the chair from giving somebody extra time if they need it because of a disability. And of course the Brown Act requires that people that are having a using a translator to translate their public comments get double time. So, um, but from a staff perspective, keeping track of who's donating time and how much time they have that's been donated, et cetera, is, is difficult. And, um, sometimes unnecessarily creates uh, complexity where there, sh there doesn't really need to be. But that's just my thought on that. Thank you. The agenda, uh, uh, um, amended choice that sounds the most appealing to me would be saying three minutes if under 10 speakers on an item, no donation of time. And if there's more than 10 speakers, two minutes and have that written out. That's what we've been doing anyways, but have that written out to make that very clear for folks that that would be a, the process we use.
if we went that in that direction, I would be supportive of with three minutes, only one person can donate time, having a limit or no donation, no donation. Three minutes with no donation, that, that works for everyone. Okay. And just for a clarity, we were speaking about three minutes per speaker, unless there were 10 or more speakers. Was that correct? And then if there's 10 or more, two minutes per speaker. Yes. With the two minute time limit, is there still no donation of time or are we considering a donation for a two minute speaker? I really want to confuse everyone now. <laughs> I see three heads saying no Perfect. donation of time. Or two and a half heads. <laughs> we're just gonna keep making this complicated. I just think consistency for the speaker so they know upfront what to expect is really, really helpful. I don't have a problem with someone with two minutes having donated time from one person, but if we're not going to have donated time for a person with three minutes, then it's not consistent. So, so the staff recommendation where we started was three minutes and no donated time, right? So we've kind of gone full circle here. So I'm fine with the staff recommendation and just, what about if there's, I guess if there's 10 people, uh, I get the mayor has the discretion to limit time if, if necessary. Yes. It's, it's again, it's never going to be perfect. Someone's going to be caught off guard who had a lovely three minute comment and they're going to have to, to modify it. There's no perfect solution here. But if that's the standard that we use of, oh, if there's a lot of people, we will shorten it. It seems like it might be helpful to be up, up front and clear in the in the manual that that's something that we'll do. And, and we actually say that at every council meeting. It's just not policy right now. Um, we do have it in the manual, but of course, pre-red line. Um, there is a brief public comment announcement at the end of every agenda, but it does not define the public comment times. It just explains that public comment is accepted on such and such items for a regular meeting and for a special meeting. That's at the bottom of all of our agendas. But again, it doesn't spell out you have three minutes with this amount donated and if there's this many speakers. So it doesn't get into the, those details. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Heron. And thank you everyone for your patience. I am supportive of the staff recommendation. <laughs> Was that longer than a three minute? conversation okay I, I i apologize because i truly do not want to uh spend spend more time on this right this second but um i know i i appreciate the um referral back to the staff recommendation but i, I do think it's important to kind of reconcile with um our practice so if there is a desire to continue that statement that's in the the mayor's notes at, at every meeting i think that that should be ref, reflected ultimately it, with, again with allowing the mayor to have flexibility on a case-by-case -case basis at the meeting but if it's yeah. and if i may also add thank you uh city manager murphy that retaining the three minutes per speaker, removing the donation of time, but maybe then just adding the 10 or more speakers um, that it would be two minutes. But of course, also leaving that the mayor has discretion over that. Um, if we put that in the policy, it's memorialized. It's in the mayor's notes at the beginning of every meeting. Um, it just keeps everything very consistent. I'm supportive. I'm supportive. And I'm supportive. this can always be updated in the future if this is a disaster. Can it be on the agenda so that people, the public sees it? Yeah, okay, agenda templates agenda. could be modified with, with this, yes. If that's not too difficult, yeah. So just, um, so I have that, the three minutes per speaker, unless there's 10 or more, then it will be two, uh, removing the donation or retaining the removal of the donation and retaining the mayor's discretion. Um, wanted to return to the direction we need to proceed for the May 21st agenda, advertising two minutes. Are we, are we gonna just do that for the parkland item? Did we wanna 
That's just, that's just, okay. We'll just go with our current practice. Um, and then I also, uh, city council member Dower had requested us to return with information on that removal of the second public comment period to find no, out. Don't worry about that. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, great. And I think we are good on public comment unless there's further city council. No. Okay. So now we can go on to the voting procedures. Um, just as a refresher here, uh, these changes include uh, roll call voting when one or more city council members uh, is participating remotely, which is required per Robert's Rules of Order, and staff is suggesting that the city council annually determine that roll call order vote. Uh, there is additional language about a tie vote during an appeal. And then lastly, the reconsideration language was updated to just kind of simplify it. With that, the City Council may continue their discussion. Thank you, Ms. Heron. I'm supportive of the staff recommendation. Me as well. We have consensus for the staff recommendation. Fabulous. Okay, so the next one is city council member and city manager report outs. Let's see if we can make this a little bit larger. Okay, um, so the proposed is to combine the item, the city manager and the city council member report out. Uh, removing the language around placing an item on a, the agenda, and then also incorporating a report out form for the city council members to complete and or attach, can be attached to the agenda. Council member Nash. So it says that council members may choose to submit the, the form. So what I'm thinking of is many of us have Thursday night meetings, so we would not be able to submit a form for that item. Um, so we would just do a regular report out. And that's and that would be fine. totally fine. Great. Thank you. I appreciate the flexibility of using the form. And I, I do also like the items in here of what agency, when, when, when did it happen, the summaries. Um, so even if I don't end up having time to use the form or if I have Thursday meetings, it does provide a helpful structure. Um, and it also just reminds me how, how lovely and important it is that we sit on these regional bodies and have the opportunity to share back with residents who, who don't have the time or space to attend all these meetings. Um, and it does make me also think about how the, the Bosca Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency Board uh, I think the vast majority, or at least around half of the members of that board uh, do not even serve on city council. They're holdovers from appointments. And so there's no accountability. And I'm so grateful that we have a system and that we as, as members of the city council do have accountability to one another. And I wish that accountability was reflected more on other, on, on boards like Bosca. So just wanna appreciate my, uh, share my gratitude that we have this accountability. Council Member Willison, do you have any feedback on this item? Right. City Council Member Nash. What do people think of attaching to this form the agenda of your meeting? Just so that people know, I'm saying, I just think there may be things on the agenda that are not being reported out that someone might look at it and say, oh, that looks interesting and go I talk to it. I think it could be like an member. optional thing if the person wants, but I wouldn't want Yeah, to I wouldn't want to make it mandatory, yeah. but just as a, as a suggestion I, to attach an agenda. I, I think that, I'm not sure, I actually need to check this first, but I believe that when it lists what city council members' responsibilities are or which meetings that they have, which board that they are on, that there is a link to that website. So we could direct people to something that already exists as opposed to adding something else, if that works. I was actually thinking if it's if an agenda is in front of me, I'll read it. I probably won't go to the link, but 
that's fine. If someone wants to do it, they can do it. Yeah, we can have the ability for uh, a city council member to attach an agenda, attach a, a letter, atta have an attachment. Um, I can also add a, a place to add a link. So it's an automatic hyperlink when the form submitted. I like the hyperlink idea because I wouldn't mm -hmm. want someone to print out the whole agenda and then get a second agenda from a board meeting. Mm -hmm. um, one comment I would like to make um, is that it was proposed to combine city manager and city council member reports. I think it would probably be best to keep them as separate items. Seeing nods, okay. So I'll, I'll revert back to the, the two item. Okay, so as of now, um, I do have uh, kind of updating the form just to be a little bit more flexible with um, adding attachments or adding hyperlinks. Um, and then the rest of the proposed information. Um, again, I, I'll make it a little less restrictive with required fields because um, as the city council did mention, maybe reporting out on office hours or things that may not be agency related. And then retaining the two separate agenda items for city manager and city council member reports. Yes, great. Anything else on city manager, city council member reports? Lovely, moving right along. Ever popular proclamations and certificates of recognition. Um, the updates to this section is adding the uh, certificates of recognition, um, adding some uh, defined request guidelines and then the issuance of proclamations and certificates. Council Member Willison. Thank you. A really minor, um, in the description of who we're celebrating, it says an event, a business, or an individual. And I think we should modify business to say entity or organization. Um, and then I think there was a typo in the second to last paragraph. It should say certificate. It says proclamation. Cert oh, I guess it could be. Oh, never mind. I take that back. I agree about the change from business to organization or entity. Oh, I see where it is now. So, sorry, uh, where the bullet, bulleted sections are, one of them says proclamations and certificate of recognition, and one of them says proclamation and certificate of recognition. So just for consistency, one of them needs to be fixed. It was just, thank, thank you. you. Perfect, thank you. I'm supportive. Okay. So confirming we will be updating business to entity or organization, and then I will update uh, proclamations and proclamation for both the bulleted lists. Is there anything else on proclamations and certificates? Okay. All right, and so I can't share attachments W through WA all on one screen, um, but what those attachments do have are uh, proposed removals for portions that are governed by state law and by the city's municipal code. Um, there are other portions that have being recommended to be removed because there are historical or not a procedure. And then there's some that are recommended to be added to new documents like city manager policies, city council member orientation documents, minor updates, um, and the addition of sections for appointments, subcommittees, remote appearance, annual recess, and required trainings. I mean, if you'd like, we could um, just focus on like the portions to be removed that are governed by state law. The city council had questions or this would be page F-1.363. Attachment W.
We do not have any questions on that on that item. Okay. Ms. Karen. Okay, and then the next would be uh, portions that are historical overview, not a procedure or policy, and recommended to be added to um, perhaps city manager policies or city council orientation documents. And that is going to be attachment Y, page begins on page F-1.370. We do not have any questions on that item, Ms. Heron. Thank you. Uh, next are minor updates. Do not significantly alter the substance or meaning of the content that is throughout the document. And then also the new additions, uh, attachment A double A beginning on page F-1.391. We have one question on this item, Ms. Aaron. Yes, please. Um, on your city council subcommittees, mm -hmm. um, be where it says ad hoc subcommittees, be ad hoc subcommittees may be created or and dissolved at a city count, public city council meeting. Um, why may as opposed to uh, must be, which is true of the standing. Like, would we have an instance where a uh, ad hoc subcommittee was not created at a council meeting? I think the term may was added just to keep it broad and flexible. Um, I know under ad hoc, city, ad hoc subcommittees A, it says and will be dissolved once its specific task is completed. Um, and then B just again gives a little bit more flexibility to the city council that uh, ad hoc subcommittee may be created and dissolved at a city council meeting. But does that mean that two people could create an ad hoc subcommittee outside of it? It just seems like it's something that you'd want the entire body to weigh in on. Mayor Taylor. Yes. If I might just chime in on this. Yes, I'm, please. I'm having difficulty thinking of a, a a scenario where an ad hoc committee subcommittee is not created at a council meeting since you need a majority of the council to approve the ad hoc subcommittee. Um, but I do, I can think of scenarios where the, the uh, ad hoc subcommittees are dissolved uh, outside of a meeting. And that's usually when the, the ad hoc subcommittees um, mandate has been fulfilled. So whatever they were supposed to do, um, you know, whether it was to plan a party or um, investigate some some issue, and that has been resolved, then the ad hoc subcommittee could be dissolved without a further reconvening of the council. Um, but in terms of the creation, the only thing I can think of is maybe like if it's created at some sort of joint meeting, uh, you know, the Planning, uh, planning commission and council joint meeting or some other joint meeting of the council and some other body, they could create the, the ad, an ad hoc subcommittee at that joint meeting, <laughs> but that would still be a meeting of the council. Hmm. So I'd have to think about that some more, but uh, I think like uh, to Clerk Karen's comments, I think it's just to give some flexibility um, to the creation and dissolution of the ad hoc subcommittee.
I would be concerned um, about the opportunity for council members to create an ad hoc subcommittee. I I certainly understand why they would why it could be dissolved without a uh, council meeting, but I I would feel more comfortable. I would like to see it that you it should be that it must be created at a council meeting. Yes, I'm seeing nods that that is something that can be updated and returned with the next iteration of this. Um, and what we're discussing is updating ad hoc subcommittees uh, B. That subcommittees uh, will be created at a public city council meeting um, and can be dissolved at a public city council meeting. Thank you. We have one more item on this. There are no other questions on the proposed items to be updated. Appointments, subcommittees, remote appearances, annual recess and required trainings. That does conclude uh, staff's requested uh, okay. direction, but if there's anything else the city council has. We have a one item, um, I believe Council Member Nash gave you the slide for the council to consider. So this is a uh, Council policy in Redwood City that um, it seemed like it would be worth having somewhere. I don't know if it's the council policy manual is the correct place or um, somewhere else. Uh, um, Mayor Taylor and I thought it would be worthwhile bringing it in front of the council. And this came up in discussion uh, with Councilmember Nash and I because of uh, districting and just making sure we are elected by a specific district. However, we do represent the entire city together. Does it continue on to the second page? It just goes through number eight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Mayor Taylor? Yes, Council Member Willis. Um, I like the spirit of it. Um, I, the, being that's the first time I'm seeing it, it might be hard for me to react exactly to it, but I would love an opportunity to look at it, um, in more detail, but I, I like the idea. I am, um, cognizant of the fact that we're missing one of our members who I know has, opinions about districting. And so I would want him to weigh in on it as well. Um, the one thing that um, just skimming this, that's kind of unique, and I'm not sure how you, you all feel about it as we continue to, to think about this, is um, sometimes uh, the press or um, sometimes with the districting, there's certain projects that are taking place um, in districts or communications that come to CCIN. Um, that are kind of specific to a district. And I don't know if that's something we want to address in here because I don't see it in here, but I know like um, certain development projects that are, you know, centered in district three, um, there's kind of an expectation that district three representative will, will comment on it or, um, or things like that. So um, those are my pieces of feedback, but um, I, I'd love to see this come back for sure. So I would actually um, like staff to look at it and see if the, what changes they might think are worthwhile. Um, I forgot to do this before the meeting. Perhaps um, City Clerk Heron might remember, but I believe this was part of 
the actual independent redistricting, um, it, what they were thinking about was that you actually are elected by district and serve the entire council. So it's not something that is new, um, but putting it into a policy like this would be. Thank you. I do recall either the application or the ordinance. It might have said something I believe was related. Yes, it makes me wonder where where that information currently lives. That stresses this importance of of representing the whole of our community. Um, but I'm supportive of the 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 spirit. I like that framing. The spirit of this of making sure it's very clear to the council, to members of the public, uh, that we are acting as as one city together. Um, and so I'd be supportive of having this in the procedures manual here or and or on that website that shows where's your district and how does city council work. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if the only and best place for it is right here, if there's something even more public facing that might be a better spot for it. So members of the public, the press and et cetera, can, can see uh, and understand that this is, this is who we are. Thank you, and I'm, I'm definitely a supporter of your recommendation to have staff look at it and make their recommendation as to where this um, can live um, with council's support. Are there any other items, City Clerk Karen, that we need to cover in our city council procedures and policy? I do not believe so. We. I think we've covered everything. Um, I'll take the direction received on uh, what's being displayed now, um, and we can return that the next time we bring the manual back to the city council, whether it's in the manual or in another living document. Thank you, Ms. Heron. We appreciate your presentation and your patience through that process. And at 925, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>